Okay, people, we'll start. I please uh, remind everybody to ensure that their cell phones, mobile, and other electronic devices are turned off or placed in non-audible mode during the meeting. Council members are prohibited from sending text messages, emails, and other electronic messages during the meeting. Under approval of the agenda, you have uh, three changes in front of you or updates in front of you. One is the, uh, number one is just on the hedge encroachment. That is just the application form that is on the agenda. Number two is a revised presentation on 5.2, the overview of HR where. And number three is a summary of recommendation from the Brampton Safety Advisory Committee and a brief report from the Office of the Chief Administrative Officer. Are there any other changes to the agenda? Seeing none, can I somebody move approve the agenda? Councillor Bowman, thank you. All in favor? That carries. Any declarations of conflict of interest? Seeing none, Mr. Quirk. Consent items, any items to be pulled out or put in consent? Councillor Dillon? Um, sorry, I think it was 9.22 on uh, Transit Committee. Was it in consent? It's not in consent. Oh, okay, okay, sorry about that. Okay. Um, Transit Yes, the minutes. Sorry, sorry, 9.3.3. Yeah, no, that is in consent. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. 9.3.3. Hold out of consent. Councilor Dunn, will you move consent sure. as amended? Thank you. All in favor? That carries. Um, announcements? No, there's no announcements. Delegations. We'll move right into the first delegation. Is a delegation from Nancy and Roy Rodriguez on the hedge encroachment and insurance matters of 8 Mancroft Crescent. I'll remind if you can hang on for a second, I'll remind the committee that uh, the decision has already been made on this on September 27th, so we're here today just to listen. There'll be no discussion, and um, um, I guess staff will report back. Is that right to... Through you, Mr. Chair, there'd be um, the only option available for committee since council's made a decision is to receive the delegation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Gibson and councillors. We are Nancy and Roy Rodriguez, the owners of 8 Man Crop Crescent. We did a delegation to the Community and Public Services Committee on November the 2nd, 2016, about our hedge encroachment. As a result of this delegation, we received a letter from Realty Services dated September 27, 2017, about the encroachment insurance program. According to the City of Brampton, our hedge is a Category 2 major encroachment. Roy and I think it is a Category 1 intermediate encroachment because hedges are included in this category. Please see the Liability Encroachment Program application form, Category 1 intermediate, quote, non-enclosed plantings defined to include trees, bushes, hedges, anything with trunks, branches, or thorns. This category requires an acknowledgement letter, not an encroachment agreement. Our hedge is 41 years old and is not a risk item. There has never been an accident involving this hedge. This unjustified matter has been going on for three and a half years and is a waste of time and tax dollars. For 41 <coughs> years, we have been maintaining the hedge and the city property beyond city standards. We feel like we are being punished for being good citizens. City Council should focus on important subjects like crime, poverty, illegal drugs, mental illness, corruption, and transportation. These <coughs> matters are priorities, not encroachments. Many people don't obey bylaws. <coughs> Bylaw violations <coughs> are only investigated and enforced if a person files a complaint. We disagree with this policy. The government should enforce bylaws, not people, because some people are mean and file unjustified, ridiculous complaints. Okay, thank you. I'll need somebody to move receipt of delegations. Councilor Bowman? Okay, all in favor? Thank you. Uh, Councilor Martini, I remind you there can't be any discussion on this unless it's reopened. It'll have to be reopened at Council, not here. 
Is that correct, Mr. Kruger? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Um, our next delegation is uh, Councilor Bowman. You're going to take this one over, I think. I am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Speakers now it is okay. Um, we have a delegation today, but with Council's uh, indulgence, I would like to uh, move item 7.1.1, which is a presentation to precede the uh, the delegation. Um, if that's uh, if that's okay, any objections? Okay, we will move 7.1.1 forward, and uh, we have a presentation. Denise, are you going to introduce it? Thank you. Good morning, Chair Bowman and members of Council. I'm pleased to introduce Devin Ramphill, our Innovation and Technology Sector Manager. Devin is an engineer, an entrepreneur, and a proud Bramptonian. You may have seen him on the Dragon's Den. His innovation, the dripless fuel nozzle, has been featured um, on the Dragon's Den, and he has worked closely with Sheridan College and the Rick Centre on this innovation. And now we are proud to have him as part of our team leading innovation and technology in Brampton. Welcome, Devin. Good morning, members of council. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking you for giving me the opportunity to present to you today. So what is uh, innovation and technology? It's a bit of a broad term. Um, it could be a bit amb ambiguous. So we'll start off by first defining it. Okay, and we'll do that by first recognizing that innovation and technology, while very interrelated, they're uh, two distinct separate things. Okay, so innovation, what is it? Innovation is, it's not a method, it's not a process, it's not something that can be forced, but innovation is an outcome. So um, it's an outcome to a set of circumstances. So that begs the question then, what can we do in Brampton to um, enable and promote this innovation outcome? So here I've highlighted a list of things that we've been working on. I won't go through the entire list, but um, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of them. So the University File and Sheridan College and Ryerson, these are anchor institutes within the city that will help promote uh, innovation. Uh, programs such as Tech Talks, uh, high school tech programs, again, these are something that will promote innovation within the city. Um, looking at maybe a smart city, Wi-Fi a Wi-Fi enabled city um, with, you know, that supports the Internet of Things, um, and also a shift in mindset across, and culture across the city. Uh, these are some of the things that will help promote uh, an innovation outcome. Okay, so some of these uh, will put us on par with other cities, and some of these will put us ahead of, uh, put us ahead. Together, I believe that they'll put us on the map. Okay, so now that we understand the uh, innovation side of things, let's talk about the technology bucket and what fits into the technology bucket. So um, we're defining technology as any person, any company, any entity within the city that's developing something unique and something new. Um, and, and also working on something cutting edge. And when I say cutting edge, I'm talking specifically about the items on this list. Things like machine learning, artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, 3D printing, uh, those are the things that, that will fall into the technology bucket. Okay, so what are we seeing in the, um, in, in the industry? Uh, we have five major tech companies within the city. The, the top five are here. Uh, Rogers, Air Canada, Canon, MDA, and Amazon. And these five employers uh, employ over 9,300 employees within uh, Brampton. Okay, so some of the tech visits, um, I've been out to IT Weapons, which is a fantastic cybersecurity company uh, located at Steels and Goreway. Um, it's exactly the feel of company, the type of company we want to see more of within the city. You go in there, it's, it's a very startup, techy feel. They have a, a skating rink within their, uh, w within their building. And we even engaged um, some of their management team to come out and give our very first tech talk, um, and that, which is happening on December 7th. Uh, Wingdwell Media, a company right down the street from here, um, working in virtual reality. Um, and today I've brought HRware Kathy to it, who will speak uh, shortly after me, uh, working on a cloud-based ERP solution that she'd like to talk about. 
Okay, so uh, some of the initiatives uh, that we're working on, of course, Amazon HQ2 was a big undertaking uh, by the city. Um, Brampton Robotics and working with similar robotics organizations for the youth, uh, promoting them within the city and, and uh, holding these competitions. Uh, Hacker Nest is an event that, um, that's held uh, quite frequently in Toronto and Mississauga. Um, this is an event where the tech entrepreneurs, they come out, they network with each other, they get a chance to learn about uh, what each other is working on. So that'll be happening on January 22nd. And uh, Tech Talks is coming back. So we'll be doing, our first one is um, on December 7th. Okay, so what are the goals? What are we trying to accomplish through uh, innovation and technology? So uh, firstly, we're, we're looking to develop a state of organic growth within Brampton for the innovation and tech sector. Um, and secondly, uh, we're looking to build a world-renowned reputation as a city where innovation and technology isn't just an industry, but it, it's a way of life. So with that, I would like to introduce Kathy. Good morning, councillors. Uh, thank you for having us. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, my name is Kathy Tewitt, and I'm from HRWare. We are a Brampton based business, and our product is called Aperio HR. We've been a Brampton-based business since 1994, so yay, Brampton. <laughs> um, in 2012, we were the recipient of the Brampton Outstanding uh, Business Achievement Award winner for in Information and Communication Technology, so we're very proud to have received that. Um, we started the business in 94 as a distributor of other people's software. And in 2013, we decided that we know enough now that we think we can do it ourselves. So we decided to become a software developer. Um, we started the development in 2013. In 2015, the city of Brampton actually introduced us to the Rick Center, which was hugely beneficial for us because the Rick Center then got us involved in everything startup and all the things that you need to do for a startup business, even though we'd been in business a long time. It was a, a very... Uh, big directional change for us to become a developer. Um, in 2016, we went on a federal trade mission to Mexico, Chile, and Colombia because we decided that we wanted to expand our business globally. Um, while there is a lot of opportunities in Canada, the United States itself is completely saturated with the type of software that we're selling, yet Latin America still has tremendous opportunities and their economies are growing substantially faster, surprisingly, than ours here in Canada and the U.S. Um, so we worked with, um, we worked with uh, the Rick Center, who got us involved with several projects, um, one being a capstone project, I think I'm going to come to that in a later slide, that, that helped us decide which countries to go to uh, as far as which would be the best opportunities for expanding our market globally. Um, in 2017, we signed up with Mexico's top payroll provider, a company called ASPL, and they have chosen us as their recommended solution of choice. They have a network of 5,000 resellers and 850,000 clients. So this is a tremendous opportunity for us uh, to grow our business and to expand through Mexico. Um, that's where we've decided to focus the majority of our efforts initially. Um, so far, we've trained and certified 28 resellers in Mexico and just discovered a new niche opportunity that fit in perfectly with our product. Um, they have a, a huge venture right now that is trying to control money laundering in Mexico. And so they enforce reporting between three different government agencies as well as payroll. So you have to take all three reports and your payroll and compare them all and make sure there's no discrepancies between the three different reporting agencies. So we were able to very quickly develop a module to allow them to do this Nobody else has it on the market down there, so it's it's a really big, big opportunity for us to um, move ahead in that area. The product itself is a human resource management solution, so it allows you to track your employees from hire through termination. Everything about your employees from their um, personal information to their salaries, their training, their absences, um, 
there's a performance module that allows you to do uh, performance management on your employees, give them their performance reviews, track the results, and it's the th complete 360, so managers um, self-reviews and peer reviews. We also have full reporting capability with some built-in um, BI, as well as interface and integration opportunities to the other um, modules that are typical with HR, like payroll, recruitment, time and attendance, those types of things. This is an example of some of our Canadian clients, although for the past couple years we've been focusing mostly on, as I mentioned, Latin America. But we do have some fairly uh, impressive clients in Canada, including Casino Rama, who's been a client of ours for almost 23 years now. Um, some other big law firms, as well as uh, insurance companies, Empire Life. So we, we do have a fairly Im impressive client base. We have sold right across Canada, and we do have um, um, the major, major League Soccer as a client in New York City, which we were very proud of our uh, Toronto soccer team last year. Um, so just to talk a little bit about how we're involved with uh, Brampton, how they've helped us. So the city introduced HRWare to the Rick Center back in 2014 when we changed our business model from a distributor to a developer. Um, they got us involved with a capstone project with Sheridan College. And through the Rick Center, we engaged the students at Sheridan to complete a marketing project to help us identify which foreign markets to approach. It was a spectacular job that they did. We were very, very pleased with it. We're currently waiting for the college strike to end so we can engage them in a couple other projects. Um, we also uh, were involved with the Peel Newcomers Society and our current export business development manager is a result of that um, exploit. It, it was very, very successful. Um, we started out as an intern and very, very quickly decided uh, that he was an excellent candidate and have hired him. He's been with us for two years now. Um, for the past two years, we've also worked with the Peel School Boards um, in a highly mutually beneficial relationship. So these high school kids come in and the, the different thinking, we call it outside the box perspective that they bring is so spectacular. They don't have the, the business experience, but they have that new, younger generation mentality of what kids are, what people are looking for today in technology and what we can do to apply to our product to give us that competitive edge. So that's been very, very successful. We actually had, you're only supposed to have one student, but we had one that was so excited that he didn't get chosen that he came and asked if he could sit in as well. So we had two this summer that sat together. They actually shared a desk and they, they had a really, really successful venture with us this summer. So we'll be continuing that program as well. We're also very excited about working with Ryerson students, so we're happy to hear that there's a new campus coming to Brampton, and we're really excited. We hope they have a technology department in their uh, campus here in Brampton because uh, it is very challenging to find talent, and sometimes it's hard to find them in Brampton because of the transportation. Some of them, you know, we're hiring people who have a difficult time getting from Toronto to Brampton. It takes them very long time on public transportation. So if we have people who are more local or perhaps living in Brampton, it'll be easier to recruit those type of people. Um, just a little bit about our funding efforts. So while we were a distributor, we were fairly um, stable, but when you're trying to develop your own product, you need a lot more funding to grow the business and to get it started. So we've been very much involved with NRC IRAP grants. We were the recipient of three different um, tranches of IRAP grants. Uh, we've just currently, we're in the middle of a SOFI loan, which is part of the FedDev program. Um, we, we're just in the middle of a CAN export grant, which is to Mexico, which um, they match any spending that you do to try and expand your business down there. Um, so that's been a huge benefit. And we're working with the EDC right now to get uh, foreign business loans, where they help the companies in a foreign company uh, by giving them very favorable loan terms to buy Canadian products. So we're, we were just on a call yesterday with a company that's looking to take advantage of that program as well. Um, it's been challenging trying to find the financing, but we're uh, trying to take advantage of every government opportunity out there before we, try, we have to go to private investors. All of our development is done in-house, locally, in Brampton. As I mentioned, finding good quality candidates is probably one of the most challenging things we find. We did initially start our program with outsourcing offshore, 
and it was hugely unsuccessful. It was actually a throw out. It was a complete waste of time. And so we found that it's just way easier and way more controllable to bring those people in-house and uh, just hire, hire locally. Um, our employee base is totally reflective of Brampton's diversity, which we're very proud to say. Uh, we believe in Brampton first. Um, let's buy Brampton, let's uh, hire in Brampton, let's stay in Brampton. And as a Brampton small business, we're honored to be invited to have a voice in the city's master plan and bring your dream to city hall programs. So I think that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thanks very much, Denise, for bringing this forward. And congratulations on being so successful here in Brampton. Um, you're, a, you're a great story to be told, especially since we're going after a lot more in the IT sector. And um, having worked before with uh, SAP implementation, Oracle implementation, uh, IBM 400 implementation, I know that the tech is a, a difficult position to work in, especially for hiring people to come and work. So. Thank you very much for staying in Brampton. Thank you very much for working with, with our Economic Development Center and the Rick Center. And uh, we wish you much success moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Would somebody like to move the report and the delegation? Councillor Willens, all in favor? That carries. Thank you very much. I believe the next presentation is yours too, Councillor Bowman. I believe it is, yes. We have a presentation by Peter Toma, partner, and Craig Ferguson, associate partner for Urban Metrics. And I believe Paul Aldonate will be making a, a presentation as well. Paul, the floor is yours. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Dr. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm going to be very brief. I just wanted to provide a bit of an introduction to our guests here. Uh, you may recall that on September 6, Council endorsed in principle the investment of $150 million in the University of Centre of Education, Innovation and Collaboration, but in part based on staff coming back with a business case analysis. Today's update on the university focuses the discussion on a particular element of the business case, which is the economic impact statement, which is a study aimed at better understanding the impact of bringing university to downtown Brampton together with the Center of Education, Innovation, and Collaboration. In this regard, we retain the services of Urban Metrics and their 35 years of experience conducting economic impact studies on behalf of municipalities, government agencies, developers, and other private interests. Urban Metrics is, fam is familiar with this project as they undertook a similar exercise early in 2015 as part of the, uh, an earlier reiteration of the Brampton University strategy. But at that time, the, the study was focused on the university specifically. This updated study looks at the impact of the university together with the Center of Education and Collaboration and with, it, with both being located in downtown Brampton. With us today from Urban Metrics, we have Peter Toma, a partner in Urban Metric, of Urban Metrics, and Craig Fer Ferguson, associate partner, to provide an overview of the study. Very happy to follow the presentation up with any questions you might have. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Council Chairman and uh, members of Council. Uh, my name is Peter Toma. I'm a partner with Urban Metrics. I'm joined by my colleague Craig Ferguson, who's an associate partner. Um, and uh, we're really pleased to be back here before Council uh, to uh, to talk about the additional follow-on work that, uh, that 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 we've carried out over the past. Uh, four or five months. Uh, this work re reflects essentially uh, a carry forward of the work that we did back in uh, in 2015 and, and the presentation we gave in 2016 uh, regarding uh, the uh, the proposition of a university uh, in uh, in downtown Brampton. Uh, we've tied in as as uh, as Paul indicated um, an additional. Uh, a, uh, uh, an additional facility, that being the Center for uh, Education, Innovation, and Collaboration. We'll talk about what those what those mean to uh, uh, to si to the city in terms of in terms of the economic impacts specifically, and sort of more the community wide benefits. Essentially, we're trying to get to a uh, a business case in terms of why these uh, why these facilities are uh, are needed and 
represent a good news story for the city of Brampton. Um, so I just wanted to start here as a game changer. Uh, we recognize that there is a, uh, an initiative around game changers, um, that there are a number of balls in the air uh, with respect to uh, advancing, uh, advancing uh, Brampton's, uh, Brampton's position in the greater Toronto area and, in, and the, the central role that the downtown uh, Brampton plays in the lives of, of, of residents uh, in Brampton, uh, employees, uh, that are in Brampton and, and visitors to this fine city. So just a little bit of background. Uh, Urban Metrics has been retained to evaluate uh, the range of financial and non-financial benefits of the university uh, and uh, the Center for, in uh, Center for Education, Innovation and Collaboration, or as I'm simply going to refer to it, the CEIC. <coughs> So our report, uh, our report essentially uh, provides uh, two separate, uh, two separate streams. One is the economic impact analysis that we're trying to establish. Well, what is the economic footprint that would be created uh, by uh, by having a university campus at varying scales uh, in uh, in Brampton, um, and what does that mean in terms of? Uh, uh, value-added impact on the economy, uh, additional jobs uh, and visitor spending, student spending in the economy, um, and then also look at the, uh, the community impact. So the ability, the real ability to improve the lives of students, uh, the ability to improve the lives of their families, the residents, and the entire business community in, in, uh, in, in Brampton. So we really have uh, two streams in terms of what we're looking uh, at in, in the report. So. I'm going to talk about three. I'm going to go over these really quickly because I think they're, you know, there there are these are things that the, that this council are already well aware of. We know that Brampton, uh, that 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 Peel region is is one of the uh, the fastest growing parts of the Greater Toronto Area, and certainly uh, the uh, the city of Brampton uh, represents an important. Uh, an, an, an important recipient of, of growth, and in fact, the city of Brampton is forecast to account for about 55 percent of, of the of the growth that will occur uh, in Peel region uh, over over the 2011 and 2041 period. So certainly, there there on, on population growth alone, uh, it starts to make sense that uh, that uh, that uh, an institution, a post secondary institution, uh, makes sense. When you actually go a little deeper into those growth numbers, and you look at uh, you look at the 18 to 24 year old cohort, um, the uh, that that cohort, which essentially represents the years in which people uh, people's lives intersect with uh, post secondary education, um, you know, on balance, you know, Brampton uh, Brampton is, is is poised to uh, to. To have 35,000 uh, more young young adults, and that actually represents, when you think about well, where young people are going to be in the Greater Toronto Area and where they're going to be in the province, well, they're actually in the on the doorstep right here in Brampton. And then when you think about university demand in terms of you know putting putting Brampton in in its rightful place as a as a top 10 city, you know Brampton is a, is is the ninth largest city. Um, and it's the only city uh, among the top ten uh, not to have a university campus uh, in its jurisdiction. Um, you know there are certainly other jurisdictions uh, that are that are a, a, a comparable size that don't just have one university; they have two and three universities. So you know what we're talking about is essentially uh, a footprint that makes sense uh, in a city of the size of Brampton. Not even including the growth that we're going to be uh, that we're going to be uh, encountering over the next over the next thir uh, thirty years. Um, so let me talk about uh, the the library and the CC the uh, the CEIC demand. So you know what we're talking about with the CEIC is essentially a, 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 you know a public institution, uh, an institutional building that is is more about the collaboration and the activity and interaction between the people than it is. With books, so if I, I like to think of it as a, as a bookless library, some some librarians might take uh, might take exception to that. But the library libraries, as we know it, have you know have evolved immensely, and um, the uh, the CEIC is really an a reflection uh, of, of 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 where libraries of the future are going. Um, 
on a per capita basis, we know that 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 uh, that 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 Brampton. Um, with seven library branches, if you actually add up all of the library space that are that factors part of uh, uh, Brampton's public library system, it's 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 relatively small uh, on on a per capita basis. So there's only about uh, uh, about a half a square foot of library space serving each and every resident in in Brampton. And when you you know, when you think about the growth that you're you're taking place, that that number is actually going to compress. So something certainly needs to be. Uh, needs to be resolved. Talking about the economic impact. So the economic impact analysis that we use uh, is, uh, is based on a StatsCan model. We, uh, we do our best to come up with uh, real world assumptions around the, uh, the costs to build facilities um, and the types of expenditures that come along with those facilities uh, in the ways uh, in the ways that, that people will spend so you know I like to think of it in this analysis we've included everything from concrete and steel to knapsacks and burgers like all of the expenditures that go along with with building with building these structures um, and all of the spending that happens within them and around them and all of those things have been incorporated into into the model in terms of trying to understand how many jobs are generated within and around uh, these, uh, these particular initiatives. So the key assumptions, we start with, uh, we start with a, uh, a, a, a university model at 1,000, uh, growing to 5,000, and 5,000 is really the, the reference scenario that we've, uh, that we've, uh, that we've you know, we, that has essentially framed our thinking in the report. Um, and we've also considered uh, growth over the long term to, a, to a, uh, an institution that has uh, as many as, as 10,000 or more students. So that's the academic side of the equation. On the civic or CEIC uh, part, we're talking about a landmark building uh, representing around 200,000 square feet, which included in that would be a 30,000 square foot incubator. And so that incubator space uh, would be uh, used by entrepreneurs and companies um, to uh, to, to, to grow and nurture one another and to work collaboratively toward commercialization. Uh, we've looked at incubators across the province. We've looked at some of the best practices. Um, and, you know, in order to develop a, a, scalable, uh, a, a scalable incubator, you know, we're thinking around 30,000 square feet makes sense in terms of having adequate space to enable the types of events and workplaces that go along with uh, with incubating multiple companies at, at, at any given time. We're talking about a, when we're talking about the CIC, we're talking about a building that's fully open and accessible to the public. We're talking about the most flexible type of building that we can, that we can think about. You think of, it, of, a, of a building that has everything from, you know, we've talked about tech talks to, uh, to, to, to you know, to, 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 to plays, uh, to study spaces, um, but we want to talk about a really flexible building. Um, a, a building of this scale, based on the size of the market, we're talking about um, a throughput of around 2.3 million people uh, through the building each and every year. So those are some of the key, uh, the, the, some of the key uh, assumptions that have gone into developing the model in terms of the size. So let's talk about some comparable academic institutions. You know, we, we, we've set 5,000 as a reference. We've also considered uh, you know, university at the at the one thousand at the one thousand level. So what we're talking about are institutions, um, you know, very well known institutions, uh, RMC in Kingston, uh, Bishops Acadia, Mount Allison, uh, OCAD, and all of those. Even the smallest universities have very meaningful impacts. If you go to each one of those jurisdictions and the areas around those those institutions, there's a lot of activity that happen. Uh, you know, on and off campus around those those particular institutions. So on the on the comparable civic institutions, we you know we, we talked about open and flexible buildings. There have been some very good precedents that uh, that this council can consider um, in the Canadian context around uh, the the library of the future, places that are that are community hubs that are gathering places for business and collaboration. And the Halifax Library is about 110,000 square feet, um, and on the opposite, that, that building is, is built 
Calgary is currently in the process of completing uh, a, a much bigger building um, at 235,000 square feet. But these are really the, 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 the kind of uh, landmark buildings, public buildings that will, you know, that we're talking about uh, destinations. Uh, we've, we've talked about some research on, there's, there's some very good research that came out of the, uh, the Martin School of Prosperity around the economic impacts of, uh, of libraries and we, we, we've seen that, that, uh, that library systems uh, across Ontario are generally, for every dollar invested in the library system, is actually yielding about three to seven dollars in, in economic returns. So let's talk about measured, uh, measured impacts. Uh, I'm going to talk quickly about 1,000 students. What would that mean? It would, co it would mean about $43 million to construct it. It would mean uh, an operating expenditure in terms of wages and salaries around $27 million. Um, and ongoing expenditures by students, <coughs> students and visitors to that campus in the order of, of, of $3 million. So the construction impacts are one time. They're felt over the, you know, over the period where the, this, the site is being planned and built. Um, whereas the operating and, uh, and uh, student expenditures, those are things that happen year over year over year over year. So at 1,000, those are the numbers, those are the inputs that we're talking about. At 5,000, they increase to uh, construction, 250 million. Uh, ongoing operating of the university at around uh, 134 million. And uh, uh, expenditures made by uh, students and visitors around 15 million. A significant increase. And so when we talk about the, uh, the CEIC portion, talking about a one-time expenditure of around 115 million, uh, ongoing operating expenditures of around 22 million, and uh, on, uh, ongoing expenditures of around 18 million dollars per year. So when you, when you consider all of those expenditures, again going from the concrete and steel um, and, and out to the uh, out to the knapsacks and, and burgers, uh, we're talking about uh, those initial expenditures going from, uh, you know, from, uh, from say $70 million on the operating side um, up, to, uh, up to $134 million in gross impact. So I think that, you know, the, the, the important takeaway on this slide is just looking at what, you know, what kind of a, what kind of job, what kind of jobs would be associated year over year at, of, a, of, a, of an institution with a thousand students uh, and still with the 200,000 uh, square foot CEIC, we're talking around uh, 810 jobs, about 80% of which would actually be in Brampton. We scale that up to 5,000, which is our reference. We're talking about jobs uh, in, in, the, in the order of, of pressing 2,000 of 2, jobs year over year um, in Brampton. So I, th I think it's important to frame, you know, just to frame how big of an investment this is actually, this could actually be. So if you, if we, if we fast forward, if we fast forward, say, you know, 10 or 15 years, I'm not trying to put timelines on how, how, how the university, you know, could potentially get, get to 10,000. A, a, a university alone, Ryerson, Ryerson's footprint to, f to support 10,000 is essentially about an 800, 800 uh, staff members, full-time staff members, or FT equivalents, which would essentially put it in the ranks of among uh, Brampton's leading employers. So, you know, we're talking about uh, getting um, a, a very significant uh, employer uh, within uh, the city of Brampton. So I'm just going to wrap up on some of the key findings. Uh, you know, we've determined that there's going to be a significant economic impact to the city. We suggest that this, this initiative will put Brampton on a level, uh, on level footing, uh, providing opportunities to youth, new Canadians, and community groups and business ventures. We're talking about Brampton taking, uh, taking ownership of its future. We're ensuring that Brampton becomes a destination and not just a, uh, not just a commuter spot along the... We, we, we often hear about the Toronto Waterloo Innovation Corridor, and I'm, I'm sure this, you know, this has come up time and time again in council. We, you know, we're talking about uh, you know, half, the halfway mark, the, halfway, the geographic halfway point uh, on that corridor, and, and, and a university and CEIC would play a pivotal role uh, in that corridor. You can certainly see how you know, groups, of, groups of students, 
you know, from Toronto, groups of students from Waterloo, or whatever the case may be, meeting halfway in Brampton at the CEIC with, with students uh, in Ryerson. I mean, you can start to see, I mean, we, we talk about this notion of creative collisions uh, in the office, and it's kind of corny, but you can actually start to see those creative collisions happening uh, in Brampton, in downtown Brampton, in the future with, a, with, with this type of a proposition. Um, so we, we talked about uh, citywide and, and downtown specific benefits. I mean, this is a, this is an initiative that isn't just going to benefit the downtown. It's going to benefit the entire city and, and and Peel region. And you can continue, you know, scaling that up. And the the impacts are significant regionally. And so, in, in just wrapping up, investment in education and social infrastructure will bolster Brampton's image on the global stage. And Brampton must be proactive uh, in asserting itself as a future ready. Uh, city. We know that future ready uh, is, 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 is a buzzword that the city is using and this really does uh, put the stake in the ground about you know, your commitment to being a future ready city. So it's, we're talking about a city that's committed to and emboldened by collaboration, innovation and lifelong learning. And with that I will uh, I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you for pointing out my water. <coughs> thank you. Very thank you. Much. you have a a uh, question, Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Not so much a question, more of a comment. And thank you very much for your presentation. I think we, uh, as council members around here and staff and the citizens of Brampton, have a much bigger vision of what this university can be than the province has, quite frankly. Um, a thousand students to us is just a starting point to the province. It's maybe a finishing point, but that's not what we're, that's not what we envision. It to be. However, I do have to correct something you said. We have a university in Brampton. We have Algoma University in Brampton. So I don't want to get yep. calls from Fair. Algoma saying, why do you keep saying it? Because <laughs> you weren't the first person to say Brampton doesn't have a university. Yes. There's a lot of that being said. And um, Algoma has maybe had a better, bigger vision than a lot of people did when they came to Brampton. And Sheridan College also offers some. I don't know what it's called, programs or courses, university uh, type courses too. So kudos to them for having some vision to branch along before um, you know, the province did. But um, I didn't want that, that. I think we have to stop saying, all of us, not just yourself today, but I think some of us around here have said that too, you know, that we don't have university. We do. Now, but your vision uh, that you're talking about and what we're talking about is much bigger than, than that. I think, I think that's what we have to get across mm -hmm. to the people is that we have a vision um, for this university. And it's not just a thousand students. It's not just a small campus. It's something bigger. I, I um, went out and asked, I think, at least seven or eight people what they thought we were getting when they, when they heard the press of the university. And to every person, it was somewhere between five and 25,000 students they thought we were getting. When I told them that the province had told us a thousand, they were quite disappointed in that. As uh, my sister said to me, who is a uh, just recently retired school teacher, she had more th more than a thousand students in her elementary school. So she was quite disappointed. She thought when uh, she uh, listened to all the press that we were getting a, a huge university like New York, Toronto, whatever. But we're not. But that doesn't mean to say that our vision isn't much bigger. In, in the long run, and uh, I have to say I was quite disappointed this summer when we met with uh, in Ottawa with uh, the province, and we were told that um, their vision is a thousand students for Brampton, and their enrollment is down across um, the province of Ontario in universities, and um, they don't see it being any more than that. Well, it's going to be more than that. I think Ryerson has a uh, much bigger vision, Sheridan has a much bigger vision for all this, and the citizens of Brampton certainly do, and so does this council. So, yep. I think we have to be, you know, in, in the theme of it will be an open and transparent, we have to be very open and transparent in all this, which we are. But at the same time, I don't want Algona to be calling us and saying, hey, why do you keep saying we're not a university in Brampton when they, they are universities? So, thank you very much. A good presentation. I'm really glad that you were all pumped up about this. We all are, too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair Gibson and Councillor Moore. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for the presentation. I think um, uh, we, around this table, we understand the value of bringing the university uh, to Grant's point, or Councillor Gibson's point. You know, we want more than a thousand students, and I think that we're we're making all the right decisions and planning for more students, uh, which is the responsible and right thing to do. But I don't think generally the public understand the value of having a university here in terms of the jobs and the local economy uh, impact. And so I think we've got a bit of a challenge ahead of us. I, I'm sure that Councillor Gibson and I are not the only ones that re have received emails from residents who are criticizing or saying, you should forget about the university and start and build more roads. That makes Joe Petushka happy, but um, <laughs> not sure that it uh, puts the same kind of, uh, oh no, it, I guess it doesn't make him happy. Um, but, so we've got to get this message out, and um, we do have university presence from other universities in, in Brampton, but we, with Sheridan College, it's almost like you have to do the reverse to get the message out. If we were to um, say if Sheridan College closed their doors in Brampton today, what would be the loss to the local economy and what would be the loss uh, in terms of jobs? And what would the impact be on our housing? So, you know, if Ford Motor Company or a major employer closes their doors, you know, those numbers, you know, roll out pretty quickly about what the impact is to... Um, to, the, to this city, you know, when, when Chrysler uh, cancels the third shift and does different things, we know what the impact is. But somehow we have to put those numbers together so that people understand that bringing the university is a distinct benefit for this city. And if we do the reverse and say if Sheridan mm -hmm. closed their doors, I don't, I, you know, I should probably know what the numbers are in terms of how many people they employ and, and their total number of students. All I know is it keeps growing, yeah. which is a good thing. But because it's grown, um, you know, gradually and incrementally over the years, we haven't had that punch of, you know, a whole bunch of jobs uh, coming. So I just put that out there because we have got to get this out. This is not so that local kids can go to school locally. It's much bigger than that and uh, far more impactful than that. Yeah, and, and if, if I may, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, just picking up on those comments, I mean, I think we're talking about building and supporting uh, really important institutional anchors. And, and you know, you just, you know, talking on that point about reverse engineering, thinking about, uh, you know, how impactful these institutions are to those communities, you know, if you just look, I just put this up, if you, you know, even at, even at the 1,000 scale, uh, between the 1,000 and 5,000, you know, those institutions, um, you know, make a dramatic impact on each and every one of those communities they are. And sure, like, you know, we can talk about uh, RMC, you know, you can say, sure, your RMC is, is dwarfed by, by Queen's University in Kingston, but the amount of, the amount of research activity that comes out of a, an institution like RMC is enormous. I mean, RMC have very, very large and sophisticated research uh, grants. Um, so, you know, oftentimes it's maybe, you know, we often talk about students, but, you know, and we don't necessarily know what the program will be um, in this institution, but, you know, we are pretty certain um, with the partner that, you know, has stepped forward uh, that, you know, we are talking about a research intensive uh, institution. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's as important the types of research and the types of academic pursuits that those uh, institutions are pursuing as it is the number of, you know, the number of students that are actually embedded in them. Um, and I, 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 but your, all of your points are, are definitely... And, and uh, there is the issue of the reputational benefit as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Windsor, if it, we were in Windsor for the AMO conference there last year, and there is a really sad city. <laughs> But it has a university. You know, I, you know, my family moved to Brampton from Windsor in 1964. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they've paved a road since then. Uh, it's it's pretty bad. You know, uh, driving on some of those through some of the neighborhoods uh, in Windsor when we were down there. They have um, they have a, it's a it's a needy community, but people know where Windsor is and they know they have a university. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moore, Councillor Dillon. 
Um, being born and raised in Windsor, uh, I, I object. I think Windsor is a great city, uh, and it's uh, they're making a lot of uh, good moves up there. So, uh, go Windsor. <laughs> Any questions for the delegation? No. no. <laughs> okay, seeing nobody else on the board, thank you very much for your presentation. Paul, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Moore, would you like to uh, move receipt of the report and the delegation? All in favor? That carries. Thank you very much. I will turn the meeting back over to you, Chair Gibson. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. We'll move into community services section. There's no staff presentations. The first report is an update uh, 6.2-1 on the Community Services Civic Center. Are there any questions or comments? Would somebody like to move the report? Councillor Willens. Yep. Comment <laughs> mostly on the benefits side of it, Al. Um, I think what I think it comes. Benefits uh, one and two there because it's important to, to note that you know by putting some of those smaller groups and moving them out of the roads We open up the little theater for a lot better venues And I just announced that Bob Donning sent out last night that Blue Rodeo is coming to town in February I think February 21st. I mean that's a, a huge huge venue and we probably may not have been able to get them otherwise I think they're the only venue in the GTA I think to this date so that's a good example of uh, by moving some of those smaller groups It's more affordable for them. It's they'll perform better, I think, because they'll be in front of a full crowd instead of a few front row seats in the row. So it's a good report. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Moore. Well, thank you. And just along the same lines as uh, Councillor Willens, uh, this facility has needed investment for a long time. And it is, you know, uh, it's well used, uh, reluctantly. <laughs> uh, but there are groups that are better suited to be there. But, you know, one of the disadvantages of just really having the rows as sort of our prime uh, real estate for uh, the performing arts is that we can't attract uh, shows that run over a week or two weeks because we have no place else to direct some of the other performances. And um, those opportunities, you know, for... Uh, longer running shows present themselves from time to time and we're out of the game. So um, I think um, with the investment that the Chincuzi Library have made in upgrading that facility out there, when you know we need to bring our part of that facility up to, uh, to that same standard that there's really a sharp contrast between the work that they've done there, which looks really quite spectacular and um, the, uh, the theater that's there. We, we need it, we need, and I've said it before in these chambers, we need all kinds of funky little spaces around the city for uh, fledgling groups to, uh, to sort of take root in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bowman. Thank you very much through you, Chair Gibson. Um, thank you all for the report. I, I really like the uh, comparisons that you've done the ifs, ands, and as wers, or, or Bob, if you did those. Uh, thank you very much. I think the, uh, if, if this passes and we, and we do do this, I think the arts and culture community should be very pleased in Brampton because it opens up a lot more space, time, and facility uh, for them to use. So thank you very much. Okay. Councillor Miles? I, I guess my question um, through you to the commissioner is there more opportunities in the Civic Center to create space for artists workshops, artists studios, etc.? Um, through the chair, I, I would respond with that. Um, we've been working closely with, with uh, the culture group through uh, Bob Darling's leadership. And they're through the culture master plan and some of the work that we're doing now. Council will, I believe, staff will have a report in front of council in in 2018 where where we will address that very need and there will be uh, some very positive news on that front. Okay. So yes, there is some space at the civic center. Uh, we are determining exactly the best use for that space. Uh, we know that. There is um, some demand for space in the area where we can actually generate some revenue as well. 
Um, so we are balancing all of those needs and we will come back to council with a with an update in 2018. Okay, I guess the other thing that uh, question that begs to be answered is the um, redevelopment plans for the whole Bramley City Centre Civic Centre lands because I know Bramley City Centre had and was working on a master plan for that area. I'm not sure where that is at at this point in time. And then we have the Civic Centre, we have the transit terminal, we have the old transit terminal, and we have the region of Peel who does not have enough parking. And then there's also land available there um, with the 21 Division Police Station, etc. So I just, there's all of these pieces of a puzzle that need to somehow be brought together. So I think that's something that we're going to have to address, I'm hoping, um, in the near future um, as we move through our, you know, looking at uh, the future of the community. Okay. okay. Councilor Miles, would you like to move the report? Pardon? Would you like to move the report? Sure. Happy to. All in favor? Pardon? Oh, I thought that was old. Are you used to back them? It is built. Okay. Yep. Okay. All in favor? Sorry. That carries. Um, the second report, uh, 6.2.2, .2 is the Healthy Community Initiatives. Any questions or comments? Councillor Willens? Just a quick comment. Uh, thank you, Derek, for the report. Uh, that's good. Um, I just want to sort of, I guess, inform the councillors how this really began. Um, working with the Central West Lynn organization, Councillor Bowman and I sit on that committee, uh, it was recognized that we have to fight diabetes in Brampton. Um, and uh, not picking any wards, but 9 and 10 was the, because uh, of demographics of 9 and 10, we chose to start there with the schools. Very responsive. I think we're up to 17, maybe even 22 schools now. 17 schools, or up to 22 now, or 17, 17. to 17. And where where the, they refer to uh, the 5210, there has to be a correction in there, though. It's actually not two hours of downtime. It's two hours less of screen time on your computer, not downtime. We don't want the kids sitting down uh, to keep them active. But where it came from, the 5210, was actually uh, based out of Vancouver. They started the program, and there was no... There was no rights. We couldn't use it. It was something that they tried to get the message across, and it's been very successful. So thank you very much for the report, and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing more, more of this in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wong. Thank you. Uh, my question is around the funding of this. Has the Region of Peel put any money into this? Um. Through you, Mr. Chair, the region's at the table as one of the partners, and their public nurses um, help support some of the schools. So they're in the schools doing some work around um, healthy dietary choices and some of those other aspects in the school. In terms of monetary money, I am not sure. I, I would have to get back to you. Um, I can at our next meeting. I can raise that as a point to see if there's any money um, from the region appeal. Well, I know. I would think from a public health perspective, um, there. There's money at the region, and I think we should be asking uh, the region for this. I mean, clearly, you know, I'm at the table in a restaurant, but I didn't help make the meal. So <laughs> I get to enjoy it. So um, I think that it is, um, oh, is there an update? No, 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 we're good. We're still, yeah. They've, yeah, the region has, they, they do some things around dietary choices, but we will confirm with you. I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, I, last, I yeah. think it is uh, definitely worth the ask. Yeah. I know that they have uh, money that they've uh, used to promote healthy lifestyles and high, healthy choices in the past. Uh, I remember with WOW TV and, um, I can't remember her name. Um, She's up in Heart Lake. Oh, Margaret. Margaret Wallace. Oh, um, Margaret and Wallace. WOW TV, the region, uh, put some funding in to, to help um, do an, on, uh, an internet program around healthy choices. So, yeah. anyways, I'll leave that with you, but I'll also speak with the uh, Commissioner of Health and the uh, Medical Officer of Health just to see if this is something that they might come to the table with a check. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Councilor Miles? 
you much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Through you to Derek, how do you see this growing across the municipality? It's a very good question. And so my uh, coming into this role, my uh, communication to that table has been, um, this is great for those uh, schools and to start with those schools. But I take a holistic approach. So there's a lot of initiatives that we have included in this report that we do holistically across the city. So my division, um, we go into schools talking about, uh, we have a program called Fit Kids, which talks about uh, balancing nutrition and, and physical activity, water safety. So we do our own things across the entire uh, city of Brampton to to, um, to do to supplement some of the things within this healthy community initiative so coming into it brand new this is a great initiative but in the, my division and my work with my staff will be to holistically be able to be in every school basically so a couple of weeks ago we did an educators breakfast with we invited all the principals from across all the uh, Catholic school boards public school boards in Peel to talk about our programs and what we can offer and how we can supplement uh, their curriculum so we see we see this as one key cog in helping to increase healthy and active lifestyles across the entire city. So that's how we position it. So when, when I re read the report, I thought that there are so many initiatives that are happening right now that could be tied together in order to complement each initiative rather than them all working separately. And I'll just give you an example. So this, the Healthy Community Initiative is really important education for individuals in our community who may um, be living in poverty because it's information and, it, and it's, it's education and extracurricular activities after school is so positive for growth and development of young people. So that ties into the poverty initiative at the region of Peel. It also ties into diabetes, which we had a, a launch of diabetes yesterday at the region, I mean at the city. The region is also working right now on an initiative that's being promoted by the province of Ontario called Community Hubs. So, We've had a lot of discussion at the region about community hubs and the fact that there is a school in every neighborhood, so there is the potential to have a community hub in every neighborhood. And certainly the Healthy Community Initiative as part of a community hub makes all the sense in the world, but also so does um, issues around diabetes, etc. cetera. Um, there's a young man who's making a mark in our community called Michael Giovi from the Boys and Girls Club of Peel. He started working for them just over a year ago. Everybody knows him. Everybody knows Michael, but he's doing an amazing job at bringing the whole um, initiative that the Boys and Girls Club of Peel are there and available to run community programs in, in any location that they can, that they can get. So doesn't that tie into after school activities, healthy community initiatives, community hubs? Do you see where I'm going with this? It's like there's, there's all these things that are happening. They're all really positive, but there's an opportunity. I see an opportunity for the city and the region and some community agencies like Boys and Girls Club of Peel to work together to try and develop this model of community hubs in schools and that's going to help deal with poverty, it's going to help deal with, with diabetes, active lifestyle, safe and secure place for youth, etc, etc, etc. So I know that's, that's a lot, but when we, at the region of Peel, we're, de you know, we're dealing with these issues too health, wellness, poverty, community safety, and then we have this initiative, which is public health, healthy eating, region of Peel. It, we need to tie it all together. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's maybe something that, a discussion that I, I can have with you um, in the near future, because it, uh, it just makes sense, and at the end of the day, these are really, really positive initiatives for our diverse community. So I'm, I'm supportive. I'm just saying 
oh my, we're doing so much, and if we bring it all together, the, the impact could be so much greater than what, what it is today. Yes, I think, Councillor Miles, I think to be, um, we really need your help that the Region Appeals step up and help us in Brampton coordinate like a community capacity builder. They have that capability. And uh, we really need them to step up and help us a bit more in this area. Councillor Willens? Yeah, just, um, just quickly, in the report, you notice that Recreation did uh, submit an uh, unsuccessful grant application to the province, and this was right at a time when the province was funding initiatives like this. So I'd like to, I, I asked our MPP, she didn't know anything about the grant, so that shows you the relationship they have with their city of Brampton residents. But could, did they send you, give you a reason why you didn't get it? They just say, no, you didn't get it. Because to me, I, I saw the, the middle, and it made sense that this should be funded, but... Okay. Yeah, it precedes my time, but uh, um, I think um, Al, Commissioner Al was telling me is they just sent us a forum rejection letter. We didn't get any uh, additional yeah. information. Yeah. Because I talked to uh, one of the MVPs about it, and her response was, you have to tell us when you're putting that stuff in. Grants are, they should tell us when the grants are coming available. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Williams, like to move the report? Sure. Yep. All in favor? <laughs> that carries. <laughs> Item 6.2.3 uh, is a request to bring procurement, purchasing bylaw section 4.0, supply and delivery of structure of firefighting bunker suits and firefighting station work uniforms. All wards. Any questions or comments? As for Dini moves it. All in favor? That carries. Uh, moving on to uh, 6.3-2, a summary of recommendations of Brampton Community Safety Advisory Committee. Mr. Crook, you just sent me a note here. Do you want to explain that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes. I just wanted to point out a correction to one of the recommendations that was distributed to members this morning, and it's shown on the screen, uh, BCS 011. Uh, we I incorrectly identified the, um, the subject of the discussion for the correspondence from the executive director from the downtown BIA. Um, so it, it did relate to correspondence from the BIA. So that's in clause one, the correction read. And secondly, um, there was discussion at the committee meeting last week about uh, changing the composition um, or, or ch amending the terms of reference to allow for the composition of the committee to include representation from the board of the downtown Brampton BIA. And uh, it was a motion was carried at the committee, which is Clause 3, setting out the committee's position. And if it's the wish of this committee to actually amend the, recommend the council amend the terms of reference, then I've set out in red for Clause 3 how the committee could pursue uh, that change if they wish. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Fertini? Thank you. To, to the clerk, through the chair. Uh, it doesn't state on there if both representative assist or one or two. And we... I remember we were talking about that and there was supposed to be an email. As far as I, I understood, both Representative Fernando and Rick wanted to request to be seen on the committee. So through you, Mr. Chair, there was discussion at the Community Safety Advisory Committee about the communication from the BIA about adding representation. The actual motion that carried from the BIA um, was generic in, in, in requesting that additional representation be added. And there was some discussion, but it wasn't part of the BIA motion to specifically nominate two individuals by name. And that discussion occurred last week at the committee as well. And the motion that's in front of you on the screen is the motion that carried at the Community Safety Advisory Committee to pursue amending the terms of reference to add additional representation, but is silent on how many and who those individuals would be. Uh, uh, my understanding is, so there was supposed to be an, an email sent to add to this for both representatives since we were short. So no email was sent? So is it? No, uh, through, through you, Mr. Chair, an email was sent prior to the meeting last week. Right. I know there's been discussions with the executive director, Susie, um, and myself. If, uh, if committee were to adopt the recommendation that's on the screen and that were to be adopted by council, the next step would be that the clerk's office would consult with the BIA to identify 
who the representatives would be, and we would uh, request a motion from the BIA specifically about representation. And it could be two things. How many, rep how many representatives could be one part, and the other part is who those representatives would be from the BIA. Okay. Uh, thank you. I thank you for the clarification. As far as clarification, as far as I understood, it was we have two members short already on the committee, I think. So uh, from the south, so since there's business people from the downtown, I thought both of them was going to be put on and then just get an email and go through the right steps. I don't know. Through you, Mr. Chair, this is this is separate and apart from the terms of reference for the committee that spoke to um, citizen representatives from the very four quadrants of the city. Right. Um, this is essentially um, similar to the school board representation, saying that we the council, if this motion were to carry, wants additional agency representation from the downtown Brampton BIA board, um, and where those uh, members come from would be a decision of the of the board itself. From the BIA. From the BIA. That's correct. So we don't make the decision. They, they make it at the BIA, who, who to represent. That would be a decision that the board would make in terms of who those, whether there's one representative or, or two, two, unless council decides otherwise, sets limits on representation, and who those representatives would be. That would be a decision that would be left to the board. Okay, thank you. Just so we're clear, yesterday there was some discussion at the BIA meeting, and the motion was cleared up to at least by the members that were there, um, to request for one. That's what the original motion was. That's what we were told yesterday. Like the other council members that, that were there yesterday can confirm or not confirm, but that's what the discussion was about. And also, Councillor Moore um, spoke about the purpose of the committee and what it was all about, too, so there was a better understanding of what the committee was. The committee was informed to deal with specifics in the areas. It was wholly across the city so okay Councilor Moore sorry hope I didn't take your thunder Councilor Moore on that but. no I, I think you clarify I was actually going to ask that Susie come down and clarify and then I had a question procedurally so council before it's one two or 15 members of the BIA sitting there procedurally we first need to agree to amend the terms of reference and that's for that's correct. Of course, that's correct. So once the decision is made to amend the terms of reference to add membership from the BIA, at that point, I understand, we'll um, make a decision of what positions at the BIA. But as Councillor Gibson said yesterday, there was conversation about what the original Hang on, motion so you, was. You, before you speak, I have to have a motion to add to I'll, the, I'll the agenda. To add her, Councillor Moore, thank may you. be helpful to ask. All in favor questions. of that? That carries. Now you can speak. <laughs> We had a board meeting yesterday morning and uh, this discussion came up on our agenda and the long and the short is the downtown Brampton BI has had a number of discussions with a number of our businesses or members about the concern of safety in the downtown core and simply we just want to have uh, a voice at the table with the city of Brampton and so back in I believe it was our September board meeting we did make that motion which was a representative from the board of directors and um, that we're going to be aligning this with our safety committee of the downtown Brampton BIA. I have the chairman here, Rick Evans, in, in the audience and um, we understand these are public meetings so we would like to align if the council so decides to go this route with the terms of reference with the safety committee to have a, a voice at the table through our safety committee in the downtown Brampton BIA. And, um, and, and so these are public meetings. We would certainly encourage if anybody else wanted to attend these meetings from the committee. Uh, so at the long, the long and the short is we would like to have a representative sit at the table for the Brampton Safety Advisory Committee. Councilor Moore, are you? No, that's fine. You're fine? Thank you. Councilor Willens? Thank you, Susie. Okay. Did anybody have any questions for Susie? Hi. Councilor Patine, you did? Yes. Okay. Oh, can I go to Councilor Patine first? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Susie, through the chair. Uh, I understood that day I was there that two representatives, didn't say a representative, two representatives, that's why two names were put on. If you want one representative, that's fine. But I understood there was two going on it from the downtown. Councilor Martini, you're, you're mixing up what happened at the September. committee to what happened at the BIA. I was at the BIA, September meeting. Well, the motion was so, clearly read, so read out yesterday and it was so. a representative. And, and so I think the 
they made that pretty clear. Just, okay, to that, clarify, I think um, the the at, at the board meeting yesterday, the board did not make any further motions on this the subject matter. They wanted to see what the outcome was today at the committee of council, mm -hmm. and then from today's meeting, we'll go back to our board and formally appoint appoint uh, a, a director to sit on this committee if the council decides to go that route. Okay. Councillor Willems, back to you. Do you have a question for Susie? Yeah, I can. Um, I can through you. Uh, so, Mr. Evans is the chairman of your safety committee at the BIA. Correct. And you wanted to ensure that there was a link between your committee and the city's committee? Yes. Okay. But you haven't actually made a determination that it should be Mr. Evans that sits on the committee if we do appoint? It will be the, it'll be a line from a govern, governance perspective back to our safety committee and currently Rick Evans is the chair of that committee. Uh, however, we didn't want to appoint a certain individual. We wanted to make sure from a long-term planning perspective it could be anybody that's a, the chair or a committee member of it. our committee. So okay. in, in future three years out, whoever is that chair, chair would be there okay. or a committee member. So more a position than a person. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's it. Okay. Back to you, Councillor Williams. I have no questions for Susie. But okay. Thank you, Susie. Right. Thank, thank you. you. No. I'm just uh, more of a clarification, Peter. This is sort of runs along the same lines as back when I was the chair of the Brampton Clean City Committee when we wanted to put something from the Downtown Development Corporation and something from the corporate, the corporate world. So I think council approved that and then we selected somebody to go there that came forward from those two sections. It was, it was more to enhance our program, basically. Is that similar on the same lines? What we're trying to do here? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, it is similar. Um, we treat these sort of uh, what I would call agency for just to simplify the term for the school boards, the yeah. BIA, that um, a representative or n numerous representatives, as the case may be, and let them select. Okay, good. Because yeah. I, th I think it is important that somebody from the from the downtown be there because it is getting well, it's a little scary going in the liquor store at night. So. It is important, I think so. <laughs> Not that I go there. <laughs> Not that you go there, right? Thank you. Councillor Bowman, are you seven minutes? Are you moving it? Are you moving it? Are you moving it? Bowman? Yes. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, just, I just have a question about the makeup of this committee. Who did we decide was going to be on this committee? We decided a representative from each of the quadrants, correct? One. One. Yes, through you, um, Mr. Chair, there was one council representative from each of the four quadrants of the city. There was initially to be one citizen representative from each of the four quadrants, and I think that has since, through the appointment process, expanded to, I believe, seven, and there possibly may be one more. And a representative from each of the Catholic School Board and the Public School Board. Okay. My only concern is, and I fully support the BIA, my only concern is that when we start opening it up like this, you know, next are we going to have the Brampton Board of Trade sitting here mm -hmm. saying they want a seat? Are we going to have citizens or uh, seniors councils coming here saying seniors are in danger and they want a seat here? Um, you know, are we going to have neighborhood ratepayers associations saying that they want a seat here? So, you know, I just, wanted, I just want everybody to be aware that there, the BIA has, I mean, I'm concerned about the crime in downtown Brampton as well. But by opening this back up and adding people, we're adding the potential for other groups to come here and say they want to be on this committee as well. So I just I just want to leave that open for everybody. Councillor Fertini. Yeah. Thank you, through the chair. So, Mr. Clerk, so we have contact of the schools. Who's saying who selects the people on the school boards, public and? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, we sent letters to each of the school boards and they select. In the case of this committee, I think there is one superintendent and one principal from each of the school boards. And you have selected someone? Yes, or? and at the yeah. last meeting, okay. um, uh, one of the school board representatives was present, the other was not. Okay, thank you. Councillor Moore? Thank you. Um, just to respond to Councillor Bowman, I, there's always a risk that other groups will come forward. I think what distinguishes this is that the downtown is a distinct geographic area within the city. 
and it has issues and um, behavior that happens in and around the downtown that I think that um, having them represented around the table and having representatives from the other four quadrants perhaps hear the voice of those representing the downtown will have a greater appreciation for some of the challenges that downtown areas uh, encounter. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, I, well, I think that's helpful. Because if you don't live in the downtown, you don't understand the downtown. And this is an opportunity to sort of sh spread that, um, uh, spread the word about some of the challenges and uniqueness. Is, uh, it's not always about the feel-good stuff like the classic car parade and the, the farmer's market. Downtowns have um, a certain amount of grit to them. And I think having those added voices as well, uh, outside ears and, and opinions, um, might have some uh, solutions for it as well. So I, it, I think that on this uh, request, at least, it is a distinct geographic area with the other four quadrants represented. So I think we do have sort of the tools in the toolbox to say no to other groups that uh, want to join. And there may be a point in time as this committee evolves, uh, you know, and, and really gets a sense of uh, what they want to do and how they want to contribute to a, a strategy, a citywide strategy on keeping our community safe. It, it, there may come a point in time when it's appropriate to add other groups. I don't think that's now, but um, we'll see where this goes. Okay, Councillor Morrow, just speaking to the clerk, and we'll need to be specific. I'm not sure if this motion is specific enough. Is it, Mr. Clerk? If we want to uh, add or recommend to Council to add uh, a representative from Downtown Business Association, we'll have to be specific <coughs> to say that to add uh, a representative. Is that what you're doing, Mr. Clerk? At your advice? So, well, we'll, are you okay with that if we amend this to add a representative? From the, down, from the board of directors? I, I don't have a problem, but just to address uh, Councillor Bowman's concern, and I think to protect uh, us from having to entertain potential other parties that might want to sit there, I think we can add that language that says, be amended to provide a representative from the board of the downtown Brampton BIA who represent a specific geographic area of the city. Mm -hmm. Because that's how we've so determined words, the like, membership from uh, of that committee. We've right. done it geographically. Okay. So the I clerk think we is can just putting that in. Are you okay with those words? Third, number three there. To represent a specific geographical area within the city. Okay, Council Moore? Yeah, okay. I think that that... Uh, okay, everybody understand the motion? All in favor? I care. Thank you. It should be Aunt well, who Susie, I guess your group now will have to tell us who, whether it's a chair or whatever. Okay. Uh, okay, the next item, I believe, is question period, Mr. Clerk? A question period for community services. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll move on to economic development. Councilor Bowman has asked me just to take us all that's left as a question period. Any questions on economic development? Seeing none, we'll move to corporate services and I'll turn the chair over to Councilor Miles.
Okay, members of um, committee, we're going to move on to the Corporate Services Committee. Um, with, with members' indulgence, Mr. Clerk, I would like to add an item to Corporate Services, if I could. And Okay, members of council, I'd like to add an item. It's in regards to development charges. Uh, most specifically at the region of Peel that do, do not align with the City of Brampton's development charge bylaw. So I do have some information that I would like to share with you. Okay, all in favor of that? That's carried. Thank you very much. Mr. Clerk, where would we put that? 8.3.2. 8 okay, great. Okay, so the first item is Modernizing Canada's Municipal Legislation Act, Prudent Investor Standards. I don't see anyone on the board. There is a recommendation to receive the report moved by Moved by Councillor Bowman. All in favor? That's carried. Wait, I've only, no, I need more hands. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's carried. We haven't, that was, this was, we were just dealing with 8.2.1. Now we're moving to 8.2.2 which is the tax rebate program for low-income seniors and low-income persons with di disabilities. And the recommendation is that it be, uh, that a $400 property tax rebate be given to senior citizens and persons with disabilities. Questions, comments? Councillor Fortini. Thank you. Through the chair, this is a great thing uh, for the people with low income. But I read this whole report. It doesn't say what... The low income is usually every sets a bracket so much you qualify. And this would mostly act on a single family, a single person as a senior, because if you combine both incomes, they wouldn't qualify because then they get a supplement after the following year. That's another $590 on, the, on top of the federal and provincial pension. Right? Uh, Mr. Patari, do you, can you respond to? Councilor Fertini? Th through the chair, the, that number is not in here, uh, but it is a very low number, and, and the, the focus of the report was more specifically on aligning the language in the region's bylaw to ours mm -hmm. to ensure that we were able to give, uh, in, in particular with respect to the definition of, instead of an eligible homeowner, that it can be an eligible person. So that would potentially increase the number of people who can get access to this program and increasing the amount to $400 from $300. But you're saying it has to be a homeowner to pay property tax. Well, <laughs> homeowner or the spouse of an eligible person. That, that is the amendment we're looking to include, which the region had, which the, 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 the cities within the region did not have. So by adding this flexibility to the language, it should open it up to people who were previously uh, not getting that rebate. But the rebate is only for people on the tax rebate if they own a property. Am I correct? Previously, it was only to eligible homeowners. Oh. Now we're saying it's expanded to the spouse of the eligible homeowner. Okay. We should have a, at least a number in there. Every, yeah. What, what I can follow up with you and give that to you. Because usually if you get federal and provincial, the following year they could apply for supplement. That's another $598. So what number do we actually say we're going to give it? You have to hit the 6000 10000 mark and below. That's considerable low income. You know, for Through the chair, year. we can follow up and give you that. Number. Okay, thank you. Um, for clarification, Mr. Patari, are you saying that both persons can apply? So it would actually be 800 through the chair or to the chair, no, it's, it's just ensuring that there's flexibility that we are not excluding 
the spouse of an of a homeowner. So it's just allowing a more flexibility to a, an individual okay. to have access to that rebate program. Okay, good. Uh, would you like to move that, Councillor Fertini? Move by Councillor Fertini. All in favor? All in favor? Thank you. Next item is. Uh, 8.2.3, it's administrative matters in regards to the 2018 municipal election. Yes, with a number of recommendations. Okay, so there's actually four recommendations on this particular item and I have been asked to split the recommendations. Any speakers to the motion? Or any speakers to the recommendation, sorry. Mr. Fortini? Thank you through the chair again. Peter, uh, I don't see what's the fee to register as a candidate in here and I don't see we needed so much uh, people to actually nominate us, some forms going back. I remember when you spoke before, I think you need 20 or 25 people when you do register. Through you, Madam Chair, uh, the registration fee for a candidate has not changed from 2014. Okay. Um, so this, this just addresses some administrative matters, this report. And in a previous report that was reported in October of 2016, as well as April of this year, um, in that report it covered off some of the changes to the Municipal Election Act, which includes the requirement for the 2018 election for a candidate to file with their nomination papers um, um, documentation that shows endorsement from 25 electors. 25. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I have a question of the clerk in regards to the amendments to the sign bylaw. In your, um, on page 8.2.3-5, it says the current bylaw makes references to candidates in elections. These references must now be updated to include registered third parties. So you have included in there must. So is that a requirement by legislation that we must uh, include that third party um, signs through you um, madam chair to you um, um, regulation of signs is not a requirement of the municipal elections act the reason we chose the word must is because council has as a policy position made the decision to regulate election signs in the past it only applied to candidates for the municipal election and if, if council wishes to regulate signs for candidates, similar provisions apply in the Municipal Elections Act now for third parties. So by extension, it's appropriate to regulate signs for third parties as well. So a third, this, what this would mean is that um, a third party, a trade union, could go knocking on doors and ask people to put up signs in opposition to candidates? That's potentially correct, yes. But and they would be subject to the same sign bylaw if council chooses to uh, enact these amendments as would apply to candidates. But this isn't, this isn't, I mean, our bylaw is pretty prescriptive for candidates, what you can and can't do. But there's nothing that says that we have to open that up to third party advertising? Through you, there is not uh, per se, except for the fact that council has adopted a sign bylaw generally across the city that regulates signs and has defined election signs. So we could put, uh, if council chose not to amend the sign bylaw specific to third party signs, it could then create a gray area about an interpretation of what an election sign is if it does regulate candidate signs, but it is not clear on how it regulates third party signs. Um, do you know if there's any precedents for this in other municipalities? Through you, um, Madam Chair, no. This is a new requirement of the Municipal Elections Act for 2018. So municipalities are now going through their signed bylaws to update as necessary. So you don't, you can't tell us at this point in time whether or not um, the City of Mississauga or or anyone else in the region of Peel is actually going to now have 
signs from third parties for candidates on, on lawns. I guess my interpretation was third party advertising was third party advertising. I never envisioned having um, trade unions or other individuals going around and saying, "Can I put an elect? Uh, can I put a sign on your lawn against a candidate?" Like you. if they wanted to join in, if third party people wanted to join candidate, join candidates in canvassing and putting up election signs, that's one thing. But individuals canvassing and putting up signs against an individual, which is what this would allow. Th that is correct. That's a diff I think that's a, a different matter entirely. And I would hate to think what our community would look like. You are correct, Madam Chair. The Municipal Election Act has been amended to establish a brand new regime as it relates specifically to third party advertisers. Yes, and, and they are treated very similar to a candidate. And um, whether or not third parties, we have any in the City of Brampton next year during the campaign period, um, remains to be seen, but this um, provides a system for regulating signs should that come to pass next year. Okay. Uh, those are my questions. Thank you. Councillor Fertini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, when it comes to the, the, the fines, we set the bylaw for the, the amount that we fine the people for the signs. Through you, um, Madam Chair, um, the fines are, if there are fines, the prosecution of or enforcement for sign bylaws is through the Provincial Offenses Act. Uh, so if there is a sign that's placed in contravention of the sign bylaw, it will be picked up by the city's enforcement officers and uh, handed over to prosecutions, and then a prosecution will be commenced if deemed necessary. And then the, any fines that are determined would be up to the Provincial Offenses Court. So we do not set the amount $30 or $50 per sign as a, as a city? No. So... I remember going back in 2010, I th you know, the candidates are allowed, I think, I remember you said, we were sitting out here, they're allowed 10 signs because kids move them around, the wind breaks down. That's acceptable. When you're putting up 1,000, 1,500 signs, they get moved around. But what do we do with these people when you got 1,000 signs intentionally done? Because those 10 were not intentionally. The wind breaks them down, the kids move them around, and it happens you can't go around and check in every sign. But when we had the last election, you go along, along the boulevards and you see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Can't they make those fines very, you know, uh, uh, fine? Like, so it teaches them a lesson because uh, I'd seen bylaws picking up all these signs and at the end of the day, their whole jeeps were full. When they go there, you know, what happens with a prosecutor? And I know we have to get a prosecutor from a different municipality. They make a deal and they walk away with $1,000. So really, you know, it's not very unfair. If it's intentional and not intentional. Huh. Through you, uh, Madam Chair, I would leave that to prosecutions in the court system. Um, enforcement will enforce the city's bylaw. I can uh, let committee know that there were 1,300, just over 1,300 charges for election sign bylaw infractions uh, during the last election um, that were uh, processed after the election. Um, yeah, but the prosecutors, the courts work for the city of Brampton too. So we, we have a poll in there too saying let's see what we could do to the ones who are intentional or 10 signs are just moved around by kids. You know, there's a difference. Thank you. Councillor Dixon. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to hear more about these free 10 signs because somebody owes me some money back for my two that... Is there 10 free signs allowed? Free... No. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, no. Um, the bylaw is very uh, prescriptive about signs, when they can go up, the size of the signs, and permissions required, and anything other than that is enforced um, by the city. Okay, that's, they're, what, they're, I, that's what I thought. Um, did, Peter, did, um, I think we were... Um, we had a report, I think we get it every after every election, of those who pleaded guilty for their two or three or four signs or ten or whatever it was. Um, did we get a report after the last election on that? I know we did in the past, but I wasn't sure we did after this election. I th through you, um, 
Madam Chair, I believe the report uh, was provided to this council in 2015 that spoke about the number of charges. I don't recall offhand if it went into specifics about uh, charges to who, but we can find that out if there's public okay. information. And I know in the past what's happened is um, those who, who have um, contested the charges, we never did get reports on the ones uh, after they were contested. Um, so could you please check into that and see, and if we have, we didn't get that, I think we should. As a reminder of the amount of illegal ones that were out there, when I mean the ones, you know, there, there were some, I believe there, as Councilor Patini said, there was like a thousand of them that were, and I, I recall like six months after the last election driving around, I remember we had a tour, a bunch of us on, and there were still signs out there um, from candidates, particular candidates running for mayor. Um, not to say it was this mayor, but I can't remember who it was, but it was candidates that were running for mayor that were still out there that uh, we had pointed out to staff to get somebody out there to get them down. Um, so so if, I don't know if you need direction for that, but I'd like to see a report come back just as a reminder to us the amount of signs that we deal with. I personally think we have the best sign bylaw in Ontario. I drive around and I see what happens in other communities, particularly in um, in elections, and it's it's appalling how bad some of them look. And I think our staff do a tremendous job, although it's kind of an impossible job to enforce, but it's a tremendous job in getting those illegal signs down. And, and not just at election time, but all year round, they, they do a tremendous job. At it. And you can just drive across the border into Mississauga or Vaughan, you could do it today, you could do it right now and see a heck of a lot more illegal signs up than what we have here in Brampton. So I've always been a real stickler on how, because I think the city just looks junky when you have these illegal signs all over the place. One of the questions I have is I thought, and maybe we need some, uh, need to refer this portion back to staff for more clarification. I thought our sign bylaw was pretty pretty specific that you couldn't put signs up like this unless, and that's when the Election Act uh, came in and, and our, our rules on the election signs came in place. So any other signs other than the candidate sign to me, would, and I could be wrong, would be illegal and would have to be uh, uh, charged or taken down by staff or whatever you would do with any other sign. So I'm not sure if I'm right or wrong, Peter, but I think we need some clarification on that because to me, during an election period, the only signs that would be allowed would be a candidate's signs right now. So third party, the way I used to, when I, when I read the bylaw was that wouldn't be allowed right now unless we make the changes being asked to today. Through you, Madam Chair, the, the provisions that we're talking about today are um, building up to the Municipal Election Act, changes on third party. Most of those provisions come into effect on April 1st, 2018. Um, if what I'm hearing you suggest is if the if Council determined that they did not want to allow third party advertising signs in the form of essentially lawn signs, because that's mm -hmm. essentially what this regulates, um, there's nothing in the act that specifically speaks to the, the type of advertising, but um, this may start to introduce a question whether or not third-party advertising is a new regime that has been introduced and regulated under the Municipal Elections Act and is a municipality, is there a gray area there in ter terms of interpretation and jurisdiction for allow the municipality to then prescribe that um, no lawn signs are, pr are, provi are allowed for, from third parties? Um, yeah. It has is this is a provision that uh, and a situation that hasn't been included in the Municipal Elections Act before, and to my knowledge, we've never had in my two elections here, we've never had uh, third-party type advertising at the municipal election. Um, so those are my comments. Okay, we could, I, I suppose we could have a separate bylaw just for third-party advertising, separate from all the rest, but correct? Uh, that, that is correct. It, it just was more um, for consistency st standpoint to include yeah. with the signed bylaws that exist today. 
I know we. Uh, I think we need to be clear on this, but I'd like. To, I'm gonna. I'm gonna ask for this to. Well, I'll wait till the end to. to but I will ask for it to be referred back to staff, perhaps to legal for a, a clearer definition of what our bylaw does prohibit right now, which. I would think our our bylaw right now would prohibit third party because it does it only talks to allowing during the election period the candidates um, election signs, which you know I could be wrong in this, but I think that's the way I was always reading it. Um, I I want to I, I want to make sure that it, it, I really I really hate what I see out there during election period signs for. It, for, it, with candidates and the signs that are up there illegally and how junky they are and how they don't get picked up at the end and I don't know what the cost to our staff of having to pick up all these are at the end but most times I mean it, it's not I'm not knocking people around this table because most times it's the people that lose the elections that don't bother picking up afterwards or just leave them out there or, or whatever and then who knows um, whether or not they're even charged for a lot of them but um, I'll, I'll, I'll wait to the end just, we put a motion on to refer. I don't want to stop anybody from being able to speak right now. Right now. Thank, thank you, you. Councillor Gibson. Councillor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, so I guess, Peter, the question I have, so it's pretty clear uh, what constitutes a third-party advertiser because it says it could be a person. Because one thing I found, is my experience at council, you have one or two people who claim to represent a big organization, and it's just basically one or two people. And they'll put, like, you know, whatever slogan they think the organization is. So what ends up happening during election is you'll have everyone and their mother create stuff like, you know, good slogans like, you know, I care for Brampton, you know, group of individuals who want to support this, or Brampton this, or Brampton that, and, and you get, and they become these third-party advertisers. So there's no real tough language which constitutes, you know, for you to be a registered third party, you must have, you know, 20 people, you must have, you know, those signatures. Because we, for us to constitute ourselves as a candidate, we have to have those signatures and, and that to constitute as a third party, there's no sort of criteria around it. It could be just a, a person who just registers an entity or, uh, you know, <laughs> says that they're, it's almost like misleading to a certain perspective. You know, I've heard, you know, different terminologies around, you know, groups or trade groups or this other stuff, but they're, they're big organizations and, and, you know, they, they provide policy and, and, and they make public policy announcements or, I mean, positions. Um, but some of these groups that we see kicking around, I only see one or two people that represent them. So I, I guess that's not something that in terms of criteria we could look at in what constitutes a third-party advertiser. I think in line a little bit with what the previous comments um, in terms of allowing their signs and what constitutes an actual third-party group. So through or you, does that, I think it has to be consistent with the municipal election, uh, the municipal act, right? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, it has to be consistent with the Municipal Elections Act definition, and it defines a third party as a, an individual, a corporation, or a yeah. trade union. And there's some further descriptive language in the legislation that speaks to a, uh, I think, a corporation normally carrying, carrying on business in the province, an individual that I believe resides in the province, in the province and a trade union that operates in the province. And now through the chair, um, would we, any third party advertiser that registers, would we be able to identify their identity? So for example, if they're, if they're an individual registering a name, we'll be able to, it'll be public information who that, if that, that, what individual who that is. Through you, Madam Chair, yes, that is in fact prescribed in terms of um, some content information for third-party advertising about who it's from and uh, specific contact information. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, two questions uh, I have. Uh, first of all, um, I do recall that um, there is a report that comes to Council that tells us how many signs each candidate uh, put up illegally, I believe. Is that, is that correct? I, I believe there was a report that was uh, provided to Council in 2015, and we'll find that report and we'll send it to all members of Council. Not that I want to see it, I just wanted to confirm that we do have, we get a report to see who, uh, how many violated, uh, signs of violations there was. But we never received, I don't believe we had received a report at the end of the, whenever um, these, um, Illegal signs have been resolved at the courts uh, to see how many actually have been dismissed and how many have been 
that people had to pay for. Uh, I don't believe we uh, we get a report for that, do we? An updated report? Through you, Madam Chair, I don't recall if there was one specifically, but we'll we'll look. I seem to recall a, a v visualizing a report of some sort that gave a status. Now, I don't know yeah. if that was the 2015 report that uh, spoke to the 1,300 charges that I quoted, but we'll find that and provide that to you with whatever uh, recent information has been provided to Council and signed by law. Yeah, see, the important, uh, uh, what I'd like to see is how many charges there was and how many actually uh, were actually um, uh, upheld in court. Uh, because uh, the reason I ask is because uh, last election, uh, I know that there was a number of people, candidates, that openly abused the bylaw, uh, especially election day. Uh, some just went and plastered signs on the boulevards all around the polls, uh, in Ward 9 and 10 anyway. I don't know if it happened in other wards, but I know it happened in Wards 9 and 10. And there was, I would say, hundreds of illegal signs. And I would be interested to see whether that candidate was uh, charged for all of them, uh, or whether he, a lot of them were dismissed and settled for only a few. You know, I think that's important to see. Um, the other question I have um, in regards to the uh, um, the, the translation, um, just to stick up for my uh, native people. Uh, well, yeah, I was born in Italy. <laughs> um, I see on page uh, two. 82315, the uh, Italian, uh, the Italian mother tongue in Brampton is 6981, and um, which is more than the, the French and Vietnamese, but yet the uh, translation service is not um, provided to the Italian uh, language, it's, it's people of Italian background. Is there a reason for that? Through, through you, Madam Chair, y yes. Um, it, it comes down to definitions when uh, census is provided. There's multiple definitions for mother tongue or language spoken at home. For our municipal election, for the last three elections, we've used um, data related to language spoken at home because it's interpreted to be language that's commonly spoken at home at the time the census was completed. And when we use that standard and that definition, um, the languages that are on the screen in front of you are th those languages that uh, reach the threshold of 0.5% of the Brampton population. Well, um, and I understand that uh, some some ethnic groups tend to speak their mother language more so than others at home, and I think it's because they, they want their kids to learn the languages, but yet they're perfectly capable of speaking English and reading English. Um, so I don't know whether that's a fair way to do, the, to, uh, to do this or not. Um, I, I, I believe that um, uh, some some uh, the ethnic groups may get offended. They say, "Well, we have more people in Bratton than others, and why aren't we included?" They feel that they're. I know I've had this uh, uh, several my constituents uh, point that out to me. So I, I think that we should uh, we we should use the other chart uh, and and um, because even though. Um, some of the Italian people, may, like myself, I we don't use Italian at home. I did when my mother was uh, when I lived with my mother because she didn't understand English. But uh, now we speak to totally English with my kids, my grandchildren, and so on. But yet, um, uh, I can still read Italian. And uh, so, and there's people older than me that uh, probably would uh, would want to see that. So, I I, I I I tend to believe that we should be using the. Um, the table on page uh, uh, 3-15 to determine who uh, who gets the uh, translation service and who doesn't. I, I tend to believe that's a fair way to do it. Uh, um, is, is that a standard where um, across the province that where the uh, which one is used, or is it uh, is, is that our uh, own our own choice? I, through you, Madam Chair, I can't speak specifically to other municipal jurisdictions. Um, they may use the same criteria. I, I don't know. Um, but mother tongue usually refers to the language first learned at home, but it doesn't may not necessarily reflect the language that's spoken at home most often today. Um, so that's why we use the language spoken most often at home and why yeah. we use that data, yeah. and we've been using that consistently for the last several elections. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, just to uh, just not to prolong it, but uh, um, did not every did was did uh, uh, sorry um, this this uh, survey that was done. Uh, it doesn't mean that every every person was had a provided a, a re the only. Uh, how can I put this? The uh, when the survey was done um, and the people did not respond to the to the survey um, as to which language is a mother tongue or which they spoke. So how do you, so they would not would be excluded. Uh, those people would not be counted in if they didn't respond. It's only the people who responded that would be included in this count. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I can't speak for Statistics Canada on the census, but I think they do a sample and then they extrapolate from that to yeah. provide these numbers, as they do with population and other characteristics. Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, if, uh, if I get some complaints, I'll bring it up again. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Uh, Councillor Bowman. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Just a, a couple of questions, Peter, if you can confirm these for me. Following up on Councillor Madero's question. Sorry, following up on Councillor Madero's question about who is a registered third party, and you said that the the originator's name would be known. So if you've got a numbered company, a numbered organization, how does that show when uh, when the advertising comes out for that? Does that show the person's individual name under the registered company? Because I don't think that name is available any other way in any other circumstance. So through, through you, um, Madam Chair, so the requirements of the Municipal Election Act speak to the, for signed content to be the, the name of the registered third party. Right. Um, the municipality where they're registered and telephone number, mailing address, or email at which the third party can be contacted. Right, so it doesn't we, identify the individual who may have started or or got the name, for example, for that third party? It may not at this point. I will say that uh, the province is still um, has to issue some prescribed forms, and particularly in terms of the third party registration. So that may be information that is included on that. So for example, hypothetically, if it's a numbered company, there may be additional information that may need to be included on the registration form to provide more particular details. Um, because the purpose of this is on transparency. Mm -hmm. um, so one would presume that uh, more than a number company would be the type of information that people would like to know about who that registered third party is. But we're still awaiting those prescribed forms for registration. Okay, so we're, we're in essence being asked to vote on this today or to refer it without even knowing what the, what the province is prescribing. Through you, Madam Chair, these are, yeah, these are recommended amendments to the signed bylaw amendment um, that we're recommending. There are 95% um, of the uh, Election Act procedure and process as it relates to third parties has been proclaimed in legislation, so we know most of it, but there's still a few pieces that we have to uh, wait for. In my view, the recommendations before you um, are, are matters that uh, are not dependent on waiting for additional information from the province. Otherwise, we wouldn't have brought them forward. Okay, because I, I think it's pretty important to know who's who's putting up the signs myself. I, I don't know about the rest of the council. I can't speak for them. Um, the other question I have is in regards to budgets. Do we know how much a third party has to spend on their signs and advertising campaign yet? So, uh, through you, um, Madam Chair, in fact, just past Friday, the province released a draft regulation um, in relation to a few aspects of the Municipal Election Act, and one did speak to uh, third-party advertising um, expenditure limits, and it, it essentially set out, and this is for subject for consultation, back to the Ministry, um, $5,000 for a registered third party, uh, plus five cents per elector to a maximum of $25,000. Okay, And that's so in the proposed regulation. <clears throat> so, would that be applied to if that if that third party is running in a particular ward for example do they well I'm not uh, not running or campaigning against does that include if they want to campaign against somebody in ward 910 and in ward 7 and 8 
They want to they want to campaign against three different people. Is their budget three times that now for each for each ward? Or do they get the same allotment as a candidate would for each ward? Uh, no, it, it is not. Um, it, a third party is registered at the municipal level, not at the ward level. So the twenty-five thousand dollar maximum would apply across the municipality, as okay. we understand the the draft regulation today. Okay, thank you, Councillor Gibson. Madam Chair, I'll move referral now of item the third part number three back to staff for more clarity on what our existing bylaw covers now. I think I think the clerk wants to speak though before we take that. Okay. So through through you, Madam Chair, just to provide more clarification, and Shanika um, provided me with, with the right information in case I didn't misspeak. The, the structure of the sign bylaw and the way that election signs are defined in the, in the sign bylaw basically um, excludes any other kind of election sign other than a sign that essentially is uh, two by two, I think, square meters, essentially an, uh, a lawn sign. So, for example, a third party, if they wish to register and then take out a billboard sign, a billboard sign related to an election um, an election sign under the, the sign bylaw is is very restrictive, and it's essentially a lawn sign, so it wouldn't be allowed. So the sign bylaw today, and with these recommended proposed amendments, would still um, only allow election-related signs by candidates and by registered third parties as it relates to essentially a lawn sign, not a third-party advertising, which could be a billboard or some other signs like a, a commercial sign and things like that are already regulated under the sign bylaw and an election related sign, or election related content is not something that is permitted under the sign bylaw. So I just want to make sure that's clear. So it's just election related signs that really okay. relates to sign a lot. Yeah, signs. I'm not sure it's clear. So maybe I, I think we, I better refer this portion back to get a, more clarity from staff on, uh, on what, what what is covered now, what isn't covered. and. If we didn't want to allow them, what would we need to do? Um, okay, hope that's clear. I didn't want to stop anybody from speaking, so I, I don't think Counter Dillon spoke. If he wants to speak before you put my my referral motion on the floor, um, I just wanted to just uh, just wanted to say support the referral. Okay, Councillor Fortini. Thank you, uh, Peter. Does a third party? have to live in the municipality just like a candidate or rent own or something or they could be from anywhere it a uh, third party does not have to live in the municipality doesn't have to live or, or rent and do they have to do financial statements just like us or candidates or are they do they uh, get, and if they don't do they get eliminated the next election they're not allowed to advertise as a third party they, through you, Madam Chair, they do have to uh, file financial statements similar to candidates uh, within prescribed timelines, and I'm not ex I'm not certain in terms of penalty um, should they not file. Well, the special treatments. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Strovieri. <coughs> yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Peter, just to get a bit more understanding on this third party, so. So who can be a third party? Uh, is there any re any regulation uh, who can be a third party? The Municipal Election Act today defines a third party as an individual, a corporation, or a trade union um, that is registered. Um, and I should point out that um, really is registered to, to um, direct advertising for or, ag or against a particular candidate or candidates or in opposition or in favor of a question should there be a question on the municipal ballot. Um, the act is clear that if a third party is um, doing advertising that is essentially free of charge and at the municipal clerk level that's being interpreted to be so social media, there is no need for registration. Okay. And so uh, you did say that uh, individuals are also permitted? An individual can be a registered third party, yes. And uh, what about developers or builders and uh, business, uh, various businesses? They would be corporations. Okay. And um, <clears throat> so a third party can either support or, or advertise against or for for, uh, for candidates, you said? That's correct. Yeah, so what kind of, uh, if they were to um, advertise for opposition, what kind of, um, are they able to uh, 
dig up dirt and uh, start fly, throwing it around on the candidate? Is that, is that permitted? Other, through you, Madam Chair, other than um, the registered third party identifying who they are and some contact information, the sign bylaw doesn't, ne doesn't regulate uh, content, nor does it regulate content in terms of candidate signs. Okay. And how many third parties can there be for, um, uh, that can, can either support or oppose a, a candidate? How many third parties can there be? Is there a limit? There are, there are no limits. There are no limits. So, so I could have 10 third parties uh, spending $5,000 for me or, or, up 20, or 25 or for or, or against. That's correct. Oh wow, that's that's <laughs> that's that's quite an, an interesting. Um, I mean, that's that's. I, I don't know who who came up with that, and I don't know why. Do you have any ideas why who have come up with this? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it is it is regulated today at the provincial and federal level in terms of third party advertising. Yeah. It has not been included in the Municipal Elections Act until now, and I believe there were instances in the 2014 election, I believe maybe in Guelph and Toronto, where there were issues with third party advertising. And I think perhaps, if I could speculate, one of the reasons why this was put in the Act is because it led to um, questions about whether or not a third party, one, um, is in fact con um, contributing to a campaign of a candidate or not. So this provides further clarity in terms of transparency that there's boundaries. There's candidates and there's registered third parties. Okay, thank you. Sounds going to be fun. Thank you. Peter, are you going to report back so we can have a fulsome discussion on the third party um, in terms of understanding it? Because, um, for example, can a corporation contribute to more than one third party advertiser? Um, so can I read, can, if I was a third party advertiser, could I register um, in wards one and five, seven and eight, nine and 10, uh, citywide, and, and does my limit then, um, well, I mean, you could change your name as a third party advertiser um, at, and essentially triple, quadruple the amount of money uh, that is, represents the limit. I don't need an answer right now, but I do need to understand. I think uh, anybody who wants to be a candidate in the next election needs to understand um, what third-party advertising, um, what the rules are for them as well as for the candidate themselves. That's a separate issue. On the referral, what I'd like to see is, um, and Councillor Gibson asked the question of whether or not you could have a separate bylaw for third-party. As I think that there's something, while well, they're still election related, I think that um, there's a difference between a candidate and the third party advertisers. So in terms of a bylaw that, that defines what is third party, I don't, I don't see putting them in the same, um, in the same bag. I see them as a separate beast. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So the first, um, I'm going to take the amendment or the referral first, and the referral would be to refer um, section three, uh, A, B, C, and D um, back to the clerk for further information. All in favor of that referral? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's unanimous. Thank you. And then the first is the next recommendation. I've asked for them to be taken separately. Is that number one that the report be re received? Moved by Councillor Moore. All in favor? That's carried. Item two is that the bylaw be passed to provide information to voters in languages from A to J. Um, a mover. Moved by Councillor Willens. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's unanimous. And then number four is that the use of corporate resource policy is set out in Appendix D be adopted. A mover of that. Moved by Councillor Bowman. 
All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. Okay. Not yet. Okay. Now the next item is 8.3, which is the minutes of the Inclusion and Equity Committee meeting. Comments, questions? Pardon me? Oh, sorry. It was in consent. Okay, so then the next item, it, Mr. Clerk, is the item that I added, I believe. Yeah? Could I give you some information to hand out? Please? Sorry. So, yeah, if you could give that to members of council and to senior management team. Um, so members of council, the reason why I have brought this to, um, to council's attention today is that there is a Gurdwara in um, the wards that Councillor Fertini and I represent that is looking um, to make a small addition to um, their front vestibule and access points to to sanctuaries. Under the City of Brampton's development charge bylaw, they are completely exempt. And I have looked at the development charge bylaw for Mississauga. Mississauga would provide an exemption through a grant back and the town of Caledon would also exempt them. What has happened is that the region of Peel bylaw is actually, in my estimation, outdated. And the region of Peel bylaw would require them to pay well over $150,000. So I've had the discussion. Um, Councillor Sprovieri raised this at a regional council meeting and asked for delegation and the de delegation has been referred off several times. And portion number two, the region appeal bylaw does not recognize the diverse community that we live in. It doesn't recognize that we don't just have churches, we have temples, we have gurdwaras, we have mosques, we have many different places of worship. And the Region of Peel bylaw says that a port, the only thing they would exempt is one room that is used as a place of worship, where the City of Brampton bylaw recognizes all of the others. So what I would like to ask Council to do, in the past, we found as a Council that the City of Brampton's bylaw, as it related to places of worship, was outdated. And that was as a result of the um, community coming to us and saying that we, as a religious organization, do a lot more for the community than, than just um, worship, and that the places of worship were quite different based on the religious organization or the religion that they were practicing. So what what we did as a council, because it's not easy to just change your development charge bylaw, we enacted an interim control bylaw and said that we would defer any applications that came in for um, that would contemplate development charges to a point where staff were able to come back and provide a report to council, a comprehensive report to council, and council 
would then um, make the determination whether to um, adopt the change in the bylaw or not. And at that point, if development charges were still required, they would be levied against the property. So I know members of council that were here before, Councillor Sprovieri probably remembers that, um, Councillor Moore and Councillor Gibson. So what I would like this council to do, because this is a Gurdwara in the city of Brampton, uh, we've already contemplated this work here. Our development charge bylaw um, says that they would be totally exempt. So I would like to put a motion on the floor from the City of Brampton Council that actually asked the Region of Peel to implement a development, an interim control bylaw and to review their development charge bylaw as it relates to places of worship and exemptions because it really is outdated. And I think that if Brampton Council as a whole supports this recommendation, then it would be um, it would be given serious consideration by Regional Council. So that's um, the reason why I brought it here. Um, I have had conversations with regional staff. I'm not really happy with the results of those conversations, but the reality of the situation is the three municipalities would exempt this particular um, application, and the region of Peel bylaw is not in sync with ours. So I needed to find a way in order to, um, to bring this issue to regional council without asking regional council to break to not um, breach their existing DC bylaw. So I, I raise this here. I would appreciate any um, legal advice or any advice that uh, our senior management team could give to us on this particular issue. But I would like to bring that motion, a motion that addresses this to regional council as soon as possible. So I have Councillor Dillon on the board, um, but and I would be happy to hear any comments from staff. Councillor Dillon? Um, I'll support the motion and I'll, I commend the motion. Um, I think there's a uh, uh, places of worship are very diverse. For example, in the Sikh community, there's more than one. Uh, hall in which uh, uh, different programs and, and functions uh, occur, but uh, I'm just confused as to um, what effect it will have um, that the City of Brampton uh, requests them, whereas opposed to our seven regional councillors uh, bring it up in, in, in the, at the region. I think what it'll do, if I, if I could, Council, it, w it would simply reinforce the request. If, if Brampton Council is, is actually bringing it forward rather than an individual. Okay. Um, Councillor Sprovieri. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I, I, I understand the, uh, where you're coming from. Um, uh, it just, even if um, we, we pass this motion here today and ask staff to pursue um, I believe that um, there has to be a report, a request that goes, it's, that's going to be placed on the agenda uh, with a resolution that this council supports the motion and then we're able to um, discuss this at the region because uh, that's the only way that I think that we can get the uh, interim bylaw uh, issue actually uh, on the agenda or even discussed and so I <clears throat> I do agree that uh, we should pass a motion here and then ask staff to uh, uh, communicate this to the region uh, as a communication and then uh, with the re council resolution and then we can discuss this at the region 
when it's on the agenda. Um, is that, Mr. Squire, um, the way that this would happen? Or do you have any other uh, suggestions? Through you, Madam Chair. <coughs> I'm not in a position to uh, advise Council that an interim control bylaw is an appropriate uh, vehicle for addressing a development charge issue. Uh, I think uh, that it is a question which should be reviewed. The question then is, do you wish uh, city staff to review that, or does council wish to make a request of region to uh, take action and have their staff uh, make a determination on their behalf? So through the chair, can we simply ask for an amendment to the, is that something uh, that we can do here or at the region, is it simply ask, to amend the zoning by the, the the bylaw and which doesn't need to have an interim control bylaw in, initiated, it's just simply an amendment to the bylaw. Is that something that um, we can uh, approach it from that angle, or do we need an interim control bylaw in order to to even discuss uh, the possibility of the amend amendment? Through you, Madam Chair, I think that uh, uh, Regional <coughs> Council can be uh, invited to find uh, a uh, means of providing DC relief, uh, yeah, right. whether by interim control bylaw or otherwise, and uh, it will be uh, Region's call how it may wish to proceed. And I don't know that Region would particularly care to rely on uh, an opinion of uh, City Legal Services. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mr. If, I, yeah. if I may, through the chair. <clears throat> I think identifying the issue and the discrepancies between the area municipalities and the region is probably the best bet. And then let cities or regional staff actually determine how you actually rectify that issue. So just identifying the discrepancy and perhaps asking for relief uh, in the current situation around places of worship due to those discrepancies might be best. Then if that direction is given to staff up at the region, they can determine what the best course of action is. And there's multiple means available, as you did mention, uh, grants, uh, relief reviewing the bylaw. I understand that the, the region's DC bylaw is up for review in, two, pardon me, in 2018. Uh, so there's different vehicles, as the solicitor pointed out, to, to rectify the situation. But I think staff would have to get that direction from regional council uh, that there was an agreement that it was worth opening up and reviewing that particular policy. Okay. So... Um, thank you everyone for your comments. I know what we did here in the city of Brampton was so that we did not breach the bylaw, was we did put an interim control bylaw in so that we could deal with places of worship and until such time as we reviewed our DC, DC bylaw. I'm wondering um, if I could request that um, the, the clerk provide information in regards to the process that we did take here at the city of Brampton because I think that um, I think that would uh, be very helpful when we take this to the region of Peel. I do understand there are different vehicles that are used but through my discussions with regional staff um, I'm not finding um, that there are there are different options that that are going to be presented to um, to the Gurdwara other than um, a section 20 um, hearing and I'm not sure that a section 20 hearing is the appropriate way to go when the DC bylaw is obviously um, outdated and it needs revised it's pretty simple it does not recognize the diversity of the community in which we live. To say one sanctuary when we know that um, gurdwaras and mosques and whatnot, they have many sanctuaries depending upon um, the size of their, of their congregation and the type of um, events that they are, religious events that they are celebrating. So, I don't have a motion, but I could prepare a motion. And I would like to know if the clerk 
could provide that information um, to me. Thank you. Okay, I would just change this a little bit. Okay, so I, I do have a motion that the clerk has helped me with. I hope that you can support it. That the Region Appeal requested to review discrepancies with regard to places of worship within the Regional Development Charge Bylaw and that the City Clerk be requested to provide background information to Brampton Council and the Region with respect to the use of an interim control bylaw in this regard in the City of Brampton. An interim to the use of an interim control bylaw which was used in the City of Brampton? Through, through you, Madam Chair, I'm not certain, and maybe somebody else here uh, can advise whether or not an, an interim control bylaw was in fact passed to deal with the place of worship study. I know there was a place of worship study conducted, but I'm not sure if there was an interim control bylaw passed to facilitate that study. Well, I know there was because I was, again, there was, there was a, a place of worship established in, that was being established in Ward 7, and we did de defer a number of different um, development charges until such time as we completed the review. So, so the Chair, if I may, I think timing is an issue in this instance. Yes. Because it's related to a specific application, we might want to add the word that they review this immediately. But if, sorry, if they review the development charge, if they review the discrepancies, which they already are doing, but they don't do something to change the bylaw, then council can't deal with it. Because it's, the bylaw won't be reviewed until 2000, sometime in 2018, and at that point, the issue of the places of worship, I'm assuming, would be changed. So, <clears throat> pardon me, Madam Chair. Um, you're, you're correct. Typically, one would open up the complete bylaw, which allows it for appeals and scrutiny and review. So you, you hesitate to do that as a municipality until your five-year statutory review or other drivers cause you to do that. However, there are mechanisms in which you could deal with a one-off type of issue, and that could be uh, potentially an IC bill. I've not done that in the past. But there's grants, there's opportunities to do a scoped review in isolation of places of worship. So there's various mechanisms, and I think that perhaps the regional solicitor might be in the best position to determine how to best do that. I think what we need to do is table the what is the issue, and then let the solicitor at the region determine what mechanism they want to follow to, uh, to review that. They're just going to look to cancel. I believe if council was to address the issue and say and advise staff or direct staff to 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 rectify this again, the solicitor would be in a position to determine how best to do that. Okay, thank you for your advice, Councillor Gibson. I was just going to suggest perhaps a, a motion that from this council that identifies the discrepancies in the three municipalities and that we request the the um, regional staff to report back on a unified, just like we did on other things, we now have unified bylaws of the region that took all three municipalities. And, and I know there's other reports coming in January on some of our procedures that the clerk is doing and working with our other municipalities. So this is just another example of, I guess, asking the, the region to, um, to update so maybe, you know, maybe that would be the motion that might get it started there. Okay. <laughs> the problem, the problem is, is the three municipalities bylaws are different. However, they all do accept the, the places of worship. Yeah, it's the same impact, but, but they are different. So, okay, Councillor Moore. I think since we're not clear on what it should say, we know what it, we want to achieve. 
Um, we can pass something today, but until Council ratifies it next Wednesday, we can't forward it to the, to region, the region as an official city position anyway. So I'm going to suggest that that we um, direct staff to, in consultation with yourself, I think they get a clear view of what needs to be done, draft something between now and next um, Wednesday so that we can pass it and it's it's thoughtful and does what we need to do rather than trying to make something up on the fly today. Okay. So with the members of council, with your support then, could we um, staff. ask staff? Yes, mm -hmm. Councillor Spovieri. Thank you. Can we uh, ask staff to consult with the regional staff and work together in drafting a motion so that uh, it, it will be, uh, you know, uh, they they know they will co what's coming and what could work, what could work. So, especially our our friend Rob, since he uh, has connections in high places, you know, and perhaps he can. Uh, Su Susan Chair, I will absolutely work with my colleagues at the region. Thank you, thank you. So, Come members of council, if I could ask members of council, what I would like to do is is bring this issue back today under government relations. It'll give me an opportunity to have um, further discussion with um, Mr. Elliott. Okay? So, Mr. Clerk, what do I need to do in order to refer this to? Okay. Uh, I would ask then that we stand this down until government relations, and hopefully by that time we'll have a, a clear motion for council for consideration. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, other than that, I think. Oh, there's. I'm sorry. I. I think it counts. Does do people want to speak to this issue? Yeah. Okay. Councillor Sprovieri. No, I'm done. You're done. Councillor Gibson. I I just want to disagree with Councillor Sprovieri, and I don't want staff to take that as direction because it's fairly clear. That Councillor Wiles has tried to do this with the regional staff and they don't want anything to do with it. So why would we send our commissioner to go talk to them? Thank you. So Councillor Spovieri, please listen Thank to what Councillor Council Wiles said at the beginning of this meeting. Regional staff do not want to do it. Don't send our commissioner off to talk to them. Because they don't want to do it. And, and, and to be honest, the regional staff never want to change their bylaws there on, on DCs and stuff. They remember... Four years ago, we had a huge problem with it there. So. <laughs> Councillor Spovey, uh, hear me. You know, sure. I, I always believe in uh, work, working with uh, with uh, in, with uh, people and find solutions. And I always believe there's more than one way to skin a cat. And sometimes, um, you know, you take consultation and discussion how to achieve it. I, I don't see anything wrong with uh, Rob. Uh, calling his colleagues and say, look, you know, this is what uh, Brampton Council wants. Uh, what's the best way to approach this? And if they say, well, we don't really want to do it, well, it's not up to them. It's up to the council, ultimately. So all he's doing is asking, what's the best way to approach this? And if they say, we don't have an opinion, well, then it's fine. But they may have, they may have a, a way to uh, work out some uh, language that uh, may help the cause. So... Thank you, Councillor Spurrier. Yeah, that's the way Thank I see you. it. Thank you. Okay, so we will bring this item back. Okay, the next uh, item is question period. Any questions on corporate services? Seeing none, um, Mr. Clerk, will we adjourn for lunch? Yes, Committee, do you want to adjourn for lunch? We, we only have public works left, right? Yep. Oh. Lunch or public works now? But then we have your issue too. Public works. Okay, so we'll adjourn for lunch and come back for 1230? Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 12.45? Okay, members of, of council and staff, 12.45, we'll 
resume? Thank you. Did you have any questions, John? This is, yeah. Council Spoberry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, the question I have for staff, uh, <clears throat> the uh, the expected cost of the four point, um, uh, where, where are we here, uh, 4.27 million over, uh, does that, is that the total, is that the total cost it would cost without the, um, uh, the 25 percent that the, the the residents are covering now, or is that 25 percent have been uh, deducted from the four, from uh, let's say five million or five and a half million they would cost uh, today? Through you, Mr. Chair, this report talks about uh, doing away with the 75-25 total because right. there's really been no uptake on it. <clears throat> Uh, the numbers that you see there, the, the 120 some odd million, 123 million, uh, that's the net asset if we were to replace every single noise wall right now uh, in the city of Brampton. So that doesn't have any, any of the 25, uh, 25, 75 percentage allocated to it. That's the actual uh, cost in today's dollars to replace each and every noise wall. So that 4.27 would reflect a yearly cost uh, on that total of that total. Through you, Mr. Chair, we're not we're not really proposing in this report that council budget 4.7 million. We just said, for instance, you know, to to replace every wall, it would take 30 years at at 4.7 million. Uh, what we're basically saying in this report is that there are some walls that that uh, need attention. And we're saying let's wait till 2019. Uh, let's see if there's any funding coming from other sources. <coughs> and uh, especially um, with with my experience in Mississauga, when the Canada Infrastructure Fund was was uh, put into place, Mississauga took advantage of that, and a lot of their noise walls, a uh, good percentage of them, were were done because they're a shovel ready project. And that's usually what these uh, these projects uh, are all about when they come from the feds or from the uh, provincial government, and that we take that money and we can apply it then to to this kind of th this kind of um, infrastructure or asset class, and uh, and that's how we get out of our noise wall problem. Hey, the reason the reason this report's here is because let's face it. I mean, 30, 35 years ago when the noise walls were were put in. They weren't constructed properly. They weren't built properly. They've had premature failure. Um, 35 years ago, when people came in here and said, look, we're going to put up a, a concrete wall, everybody says, well, concrete, look at that. You know, concrete's been around in Rome for thousands of years. This, this, the noise wall will last thousands of years. Well, it, well, it hasn't for various reasons. And, and um, we, the city of Brampton, approved that product to be used. And so now the homeowner is 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 he's got a clause on title saying that he's got to repair it. And if you take a look at an average home that has maybe 50 feet of backyard, approximately 15 meters, at $1,800 a meter, that's $27,000 to replace just the backyard noise wall. And then and in a 75-25 percent scenario, the homeowner is on the hook for over $7,000 of that. So this is from a, can you really expect a homeowner to, to, to take on that kind of responsibility when they really had no choice uh, when, they bought, when they bought the home when they, and they came with that asset that was approved by the municipality? That's why the report's before you, so that when funding becomes available that we can change it over. Well, through the chair, um, on, on that issue, um, there are many, there's a, when I drive, I see some, uh, the noise walls or fencing that, um, for instance, let's take Williams Parkway, for instance, uh, is, uh, or North Park Drive, or homes back onto uh, these roads. And uh, there's some um, old fences there, some wooden fences, and they're all falling down, and they're all old, and they're derelict. And, and uh, would they also <coughs> uh, qualify for replacement when uh, those roads uh, uh, re, uh, re, reconstructed. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, 
those are old fences and they are they're 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 made out of wood or they're made out of um, uh, the uh, the the not the steel um, chain link thank you <laughs> chain link and wood and uh, let's face it you know you look into people's backyards and there's all kinds of stuff going on and it's not really uh, the most uh, aesthetically pleasing uh, look so. When we come through with, with a road reconstruction project, we do a noise, uh, a noise study, and, and if warranted, because of the widening, then we, the city, p construct a noise wall. And I believe on Williams Parkway, the noise wall, or the noise study has been completed, and all of those residences uh, qualify for a noise wall. <coughs> so as we do, as we inch forward to, to looking at reconstructing Williams Parkway, uh, we will be putting in a noise wall and taking down the existing fencing. So that's uh, that doesn't that has nothing to do with any of this inventory here. That'll be added. That inventory will be added to what's what's noted here. Oh, okay. So this is only the uh, concrete walls uh, we're talking about. This report. Th these are these are the existing noise walls. Whether, on, along city right away. Whether they be the wood or concrete? I believe so. Because yeah, because the new areas, like in my area, they're all wood, and they're on private property, and now they, some of them are starting to fall over because the posts are rotting, and um, some people are fixing them, some people put a 2 by 4 as an anger to stop them from falling over, so you see all kinds of stuff uh, going on. So, yeah, okay. Thanks. That answers my question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Do you have a motion to receive the report? Sir. All in favor of receiving the report on the noise walls? That okay. carries. Thank you. The next report is 9.2.2. It's parking related issues, Thunderbird Trail Ward 9. Do either one of the councillors on that area have questions? Or, whoa, oh, Councillor Spulberry, you're by. Yeah, board, I'll that move that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Fertini, you're on the board. Do you have a question on? Uh, no. Is there any reason? Like, are we looking at roads where they're very tight for fire trucks and all, or just certain roads? All roads. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we we always look to see that emergency vehicles can get through. Because we look at these new suburbs now, the, the roads are getting narrower and narrower. So I think I always believe that every side street should have no parking on one side, because it becomes a. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Spilberry has moved that. All in favor? That carries. Next report is 9.2.3. It's uh, another traffic operations. It's the General Traffic Bylaw 93-93 Administration Update. It's a recommendation. Does anyone have any questions on that? Councillor Fortini, we do move that? Yeah. Councillor Fortini has moved that. All in favor? That carries. Thank you. Uh, 9.3.1, the minutes of the trap is in consent. The next two, 9.3.2, <coughs> is also in consent. And 9.3.3, Councillor Dillon, you remove this from consent. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have some questions of clarification to the Chair, and hopefully uh, you can provide a, an update. Um, some residents had contacted me with some concerns about some comments made um, by a member of the Transit uh, Council of Chairs, and I was hoping to get some uh, clarification. Um, the reason for some of the concerns was just because of some of the hiccups uh, that the uh, committee has seen uh, thus far. Number one is uh, the forming of the committee. Um, what they've uh, identified or told me was that, um, you know, it was... Um, they're concerned because it was created only after a, an article in The Guardian. Uh, subsequently, uh, another article in The Guardian uh, stated that they were, un, un, sorry, underprepared. Um, and so the other concern is that there's no representation, uh, citizen representation on the committee as well. So uh, I just want to ensure that going forward, the committee is uh, meeting the needs of the residents and fully prepared uh, because public perception is that it's been a rocky start so far. So just just for clarification, I have some questions. Um, 
Number one is, was there any instruction to meet uh, with all of the relevant uh, officials in uh, both the higher levels of government, uh, provincial and federal, to ensure that uh, Brampton is at the table for all transit expan expansion negotiations uh, and for all funding opportunities? I think I'll we'll turn it over to Joe Patisca there, but I believe it was. Through you, Mr. Chair, the mandate um, of the uh, Transit Committee of Chairs is to identify issues for Brampton, uh, make suggestions, perhaps meet with MPs, MPPs. Uh, at the very first inaugural meeting, there was no direction at that meeting that was given to meet with any MP or MPPs. Um, was there anybody who was uh, chosen as a designate to, to, uh, to speak with uh, MPs if there were any meetings? Or was the entire uh, council going to go? Committee. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, when the uh, Committee of Chairs was uh, formed, uh, the way the, and I'll, maybe I'll defer to the clerk, but there was a clause in there about the mayor and one member of the, of the committee uh, when, they, when they met with uh, any provincial or, um, uh, provincial or federal <laughs> official. So maybe the clerk can clarify that. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, on the screen is an extract from the council-approved terms of reference for this committee, and the second bullet speaks to um, the participation of the mayor and possibly one member from the committee in uh, scheduled meetings with senior levels of government, and the, the third bullet speaks to um, this committee possibly hosting meetings with locally elected MPs and MPPs to discuss regional connection game changers which is within the mandate of the committee. Right. The second question was, was there any discussion on um, getting on one of the uh, Metrolinx uh, uh, Blinks's committees or getting an immediate meeting with Metrolinx? Was there anything, any framework set out for that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, there wasn't anything specific. However, Metrolinx is coming to the planning committee meeting uh, on November the 20th. And they're, to, they're here to uh, talk about their regional transportation plan, their, their proposed update, and their, their draft. Uh, we have been participating at a staff level, providing comments to them about the regional transportation plan, which we sent to them, and the comments are due by this Friday. Uh, they're showing up here on, uh, on Monday, and we're going to have all those, well, we actually sent all those comments out to uh, uh, Mayor and members of council last week. Um, so if there's any changes or any additions, we can still do that after the 20th. But um, that's the first meeting. Right. Uh, through uh, the CAO's office, we're, we're meeting with the uh, CAO of the new CAO of Metrolinx. And I believe that's happening on December the 8th. So that's, that's been set up. Mm -hmm. So there are meetings and we are participating where we can, uh, when we can. And just to complement that, the, the, the new CEO, we reached out to them as soon as he was announced. He's meeting with the mayor um, on December 8th as well. So, um, the final question is, was there any discussion about uh, a transit master plan to align with the OP and any other uh, growth plans or strategic plans so that they're in sync with uh, the transit needs and uh, uh, the necessary coverage for uh, future residents? Through you, Mr. Chair, we're we're looking. We're updating. The city of Brampton is updating their transportation master plan, uh, which is going to start in uh, Q1 of 2018. Uh, we took a look at the regional transportation master plan, and we provided input based on our transit needs uh, to them. And there's going to be more discussion taking place. Uh, the the regional transportation plan uh, is is building upon the big move plan that was presented uh, in 2006-2007. They have to update that every 10 years. So as they're updating it, they identify all major corridors, all major transit facilities, and we're providing input into that through our, through our transit people, through our long-range transportation people. Right. So just for the benefit of uh, the residents, transit users, is there any type of timeline or hard dates that we're looking at that we want to accomplish? Uh, certain things, by, or you know, maybe even have certain meetings by. Uh, yeah, we through you, Mr. Chair. We have um, we've set up uh, through the through the CAO's office and through through the senior leadership team. 
the six game changers. The one game changer is the uh, is the regional connections. There are 21 separate projects within within that category. Uh, some of them are led by the province. Some of them are led by the region appeal. Some of them are led by the Toronto Airport Authority, and some of them are led by us. Each and every one of those projects has a timeline associated with it, uh, and I, I don't have that list with me uh, right now, but certainly happy to uh, reintroduce it. Uh, so we've identified time our own timelines. We have specific timelines right. for for each and every one of those projects. Yes. Right. And so where, where is that, like for anybody who wants to check it out, where would they be able to find it? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I believe the Game Changers are, are on uh, are on the web page that you can look, look it up. and. Uh, with the agenda. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Thank you, through the Chair. Sure. I, so I guess to, Joan, it's unfair to put it on you. Uh, I think, you know, Councilor uh, Dillon, yeah, it raises from the onset I was against the formation of this committee because when we're talking about a steering committee, on initiatives and you're telling me there was no direction given at the last meeting so the idea I thought was to sort of a call for action rally the troops uh, you have the chairs and I don't know why we specified the chairs um, and then you're telling me they're only gonna meet a couple of times so I thought there would be more of an aggressive schedule considering our transit needs and all the game changers um, and I don't know if that's consideration for uh, the members of council or uh, the folks that belong to this but to meet two or three times to go over, I'm not sure what. Because is there anything specific at the transit committee that other members of council don't benefit from? Or you were doing all this anyways. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Well, first of all, fr from my perspective, the, the, the committee of chairs dovetails nicely with the regional connections because that's what we're looking at at a staff level. So now that's something that we're looking holistically, strictly transportation on a, on a fairly high level. So that, that, that's a good thing for us. Um, the two dates that were specified for meeting dates were also uh, chosen strategically, uh, one in the fall and I believe the other one's in June. And the one in the fall is that when, uh, when budgets are being prepared, if there's anything that's necessary, it can, we can flag that then to the rest of council. So uh, if we need money for any special project or study, what have you, that that can be flagged and, and put into the budget in a timely manner. The, the, other, uh, the other meeting in June is to start preparing for uh, the AMO meetings that, that traditionally happen in the summer. So those are the two dates, but also uh, at, the, at, the, at the call of the chair, uh, that committee can meet at any time. Uh, through the chair, yeah, and I would, I would say with the formation of this committee, I would expect more of an aggressive calendar because you're telling me something that's going to move out in June, we're pretty much in lame deck uh, period, and if, if we want to be aggressive on some of these, you know, dates, I would expect or I would encourage my colleagues to have more of an aggressive schedule and meeting and make this maybe a monthly meeting uh, with uh, the transit needs that we have. But through the chair, the, the issue I have, Joe, is I still don't understand a lot of this, we were doing this anyways. So this information, you're saying that it ducktails well with the regional plan. I don't know what we're ducktailing. Like, I don't understand what the committee, in terms of steering or, or recommendations or, or direction, is giving that is not happening. Um, that didn't happen previously. And I had said that already uh, previously. I guess my frustration now is it almost seems that this is, you know, more smokes and mirrors. It's getting together to rediscuss issues that we already had discussed about. And there's, no, there's nothing really new coming out of this committee. Um, and I know it was at the time a knee-jerk reaction to a, a media article that we have to have some transit. But unless, I guess, you know, maybe with more thorough meetings and, and more of an aggressive schedule, there, there might be some, some recommendations or, or some movement on the file. Uh, the fact that there hasn't been a, a request to even want to meet with other levels of government. Um, just the other day, the Minister of Transportation was in Brampton. Um, so I guess with the mayor meeting, Metrolinks uh, coming up on the 8th, is that what you said? So. It'd be great if someone from the, I guess, this committee show, uh, you know, be present. Um, and then after there'd be more opportunities, like we have, I guess, the provincial, uh, um, with all the other, uh, I guess, priorities and announceables, it'd be great, you know, if we see um, some meetings come up and, and outreach to the other politicians. I sit on, I attended the first Metrolinks committee meeting, um, which is going to have a significant impact uh, in our community. Um, and I know there's a staff person there, but it might be a suggestion that maybe from someone from the council, from this transit committee also, 
uh, be part of this MetroLink's committee as well. Three, three, Mr. Chair, to, to Councilor Madero. So I think those are all valid and, and good suggestions. Um, and, and I just point out that this was the very first meeting, and, and obviously we have to grow the committee, and, 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 and it has to mature as well. So with that, and, and taking your comments, uh, they're, they're all valid. Yeah, and through the chair, and I guess my concern is always the duplication of efforts because, you know, I sit on the cycling committee, and I have folks from the cycling committee might ask me in terms of this transit committee, what in terms of representation, and why it was formed in this manner. I think the second thing is the duplication of efforts. You know, something... If staff is running away, you guys are meeting to basically discuss materials and, and there's no real sort of direction or insight that's provided out of it unless there's a strategy. So I look forward to the next couple of months, you know, some clear recommendations or a strategy coming out of this committee because for us to have a committee, and, it's that, and that sort of applies to all the committees that we do, unless there's some strong recommendations coming out of it, um, you know, I just think that it's an effort of, you know, duplication that we were doing already. Anyways, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Interesting uh, conversation. Um, uh, Mr. Clerk, was all members of council notified of the meeting? Uh, yes. Three and the agenda? Chair. Yes, it's distributed and to all And all of members. the information provided to members of the committee? Yes. So any member of council could have attended that if they, if they had interest, even though it's... Uh, a committee for um, that was formed as a, a council of chairs. Any member of council is welcome to attend the meeting, or the public. The public can attend too. I, it's you know these are all of our meetings are are open. Um, I think it's unfortunate. I don't think the article um, in the press really reflected what happened. It wasn't really a joke. I think it was a a very good meeting. Um, what what we did find as members of the committee was we had a comprehensive review of all of the transportation work that the City of Brampton is doing and is involved with. Um, members of Council were able to ascertain from our staff where they were pay playing lead roles in making decisions around um, what was happening. Are you listening after the comments, or are you texting? Sorry, Sorry I'm, I'm speaking Sorry. in regards to your, your texting while I'm speaking. Thank you. I just would like you to listen. Well, I mean, it's, if, if, if you want to, to uh, address a committee meeting and, and infer that it was not... Uh, doing its work. I don't think you should be texting while, when a member of the, who, the committee who was there is trying to explain that. In fact, it was a very good committee meeting. Uh, on a point of order. Come on. Excuse me. You do not have the floor? For texting when you're not supposed to be. You know what? You were, I, I could see ask, you. Listen, I would ask that if you have issues with my behavior or my performance on council, that you know, the remaining, I have every right to do what I want to here in this council chambers as respectfully as one. But to call me out to say I didn't pay attention or listening, I'm listening to what I think is burdened. I'm not going to go there, Martin. You, I mean, you, you're obviously, yeah, I have the floor, right? So thank you very much, and I would just appreciate it if members of council would listen to, to the comments. You could have attended the meeting. You can attend any meeting, and you're back on your BlackBerry. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. I'm not Ross. saying anymore. Councilor Dillon. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just want to just, um, you know, there was a, an article written. Uh, perhaps, uh, Councilor Miles, it was your comments here. Um, maybe perhaps you could clarify as well because you suggested that uh, other than performing advo advocacy work, there's little point in having elected officials uh, set, a time, set time aside for regular uh, transit focus committees. You also um, 
question the purpose of the committee. If there's added value, what's the point? Um, you know, if I asked staff, could you just not tell me what is needed from council? So uh, I bet you could, <coughs> uh, bet you could without doing all of this. So in terms of, uh, uh, to Council Maduro's points of duplication and uh, smokes and mirrors, um, you know, if we, there was years of inactivity on council, years of inactivity. And uh, again, because of an article, that was a knee-jerk reaction to, to getting this committee. So, um, you know, we were talking about duplication, just smokes and mirrors, or, or if you're talking about a more aggressive approach uh, to this, just because, um, you know, there's so little time in between. Um, you know, when we go uh, into an election season in June, um, you know, what, what is the real purpose of this? And so I'm asking you that, maybe if you can clarify um, some of those comments that you made uh, in uh, in the article, just because, again, a lot of people uh, contacted me with uh, with their concerns. They can contact me at any time. Perhaps you could uh, clarify these comments because you're, a, you're 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 one of the forming members. You seconded the motion as well, and the person who you know formed the committee, uh, their question the purpose of the committee as well. So, perhaps if you could comment on that. Yeah, well, I'm not done. Now she can answer. Okay, so you don't want to answer the question? I'm not going to answer back to you. This is not the kind of forum where we, we're ending up debating. This is a committee that was right. formed by council with the majority yes. of council. So if you want to reopen the issue, reopen the issue. I'm just asking but pertinent take questions. A pertinent article, okay. Take a newspaper article and start quoting what a reporter wrote right. when I just said that the article really did not Council Miles, could you address the remarks through through the chair, please? Can I speak? Do I have the floor still? I am. She's done. Hey. Hey. You know Council Dillon, you guys are, just are you? Playing up to the reporter. So, go ahead. Can I can I speak? Go ahead. So I think so. The reason why I, I'm not playing up to anybody. These are pertinent questions. Council Miles, you guys had years to do something. Members, you had a knee members of committees. Members of committee. And I'm please. asking some some pertinent questions. And and, and if uh, you've you know, the quotes are there that you made. I'm just asking you because in this, you question the purpose of the meeting. Uh, we're wasting, and if it's true, we're wasting taxpayer time and money. Members and we're of duplicating a lot of uh, work that I'll could already be done I'll by staff. Members of committee, I'd like to remind all the members of committee that this is a committee of council. Remarks from individual members are to be addressed through the chair to the committee. This is not a debate across <clears throat> um, various seats. It's through the chair to the committee. Thank you. Um, so, this on the floor. Through the chair, sure. Yeah, through the chair. So, through the chair, um, I felt like there were very pertinent questions. I think when we're dealing with transit, uh, we're dealing with uh, a lot of issues that need to be addressed. I think uh, um, if quotes were made, I think it's very reasonable for me to ask for clarifications, just like I ask for <coughs> clarifications, uh, just like all council members do when minutes come across. So, um, uh, you know, I'm disappointed that you didn't answer the question. I'm not playing to anybody here. Uh, but I think it's very relevant to ask these because uh, we're talking about uh, a committee that was formed uh, that's dealing with uh, transit. And I think uh, two meetings is not enough. And I think that the fact that we don't have any uh, you know, public representation, uh, we don't have any students here, we don't have any actual transit users giving their input, uh, it you know, begs me to wonder what the purpose of the committee is. Because what's the real input that we're getting into it? So, uh, you know, that's your... <coughs> Uh, decision if you don't want to answer. Thank you. Council Medeiros. Yes, through the chair, just for clarification to Councilor Miles' accusation of me texting, not listening to you, I have a team from regional staff here who, as chair of uh, human services, wanted to tape a video message and they're waiting in my office uh, regarding housing. Uh, second, I will say the article did not sway me in any way regarding my questions or uh, regarding my comments. They're very consistent to the onset when I opposed the motion in the second place. I thirdly, I recognize Council's decision to have formed this committee, so my suggestion being is that if this committee has any teeth, considering that there aren't exactly what Councilor Jim said, then I would just hope that there's more of an aggressive schedule. I support the work here, and if some good recommendations come out, then I look forward to them. So I would just ask that a little bit more aggressiveness regarding, we talked about two meetings, so I encourage, I guess, the Chair 
that I ask that for a more aggressive schedule of meetings. We have a mayor who's uh, meeting with Metrolinx. It would be great that someone from the Transit Committee be there. I said on Metrolinx, on that committee, I would like to see a member of the Transit Chairs be there as well. And I think there would be an opportunity on a monthly basis, if there's going to be some strong recommendations, that we meet on a monthly basis, or this committee meet on a monthly basis, so that we get some strong recommendations before we enter in lame duck uh, period. So that's all I'm saying, is, is I'm encouraging this, this committee to come forth with the good strategy and some good recommendations. And I must excuse myself, and I say thank you. Thank you, Councilman Heroes. Councilman Spoberry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a, a question, clarification. Uh, when this committee was established, uh, was there a terms of reference that were developed and uh, brought to council for uh, approval? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes. They were approved, I believe, on June 7th of this year by council. And, and uh, the, it, um, in the terms, it uh, outlined what the, um, what the goal of the committee uh, would be? Yes. And, um, and it's mostly for advocacy, is, it? is that what the main purpose? That, that is one of the objectives, yes. And um, so uh, through the chair, uh, I know there's only been two meetings, but um, one meeting. So has there, uh, is, there, is there a plan to advocate or for the committee to go down and meet with uh, uh, the province for uh, for more funding or with uh, with uh, the federal government and the infrastructure funding is that is that is, is there a plan to do that uh, through through the chair is that been is that is there a, a work work plan in place to uh, to do that or is it has the committee decided that in the uh, John wants to speak uh, through you Mr. Chair. Again, I, I, I go back to the regional connections and the 21 projects that were identified. Each and every one of those projects are at different stages and, and, and a different uh, process, uh, stages and processes. And the way I see it is that if one of those projects gets to a point and funding is available, at that point we will then come back to the Transit Committee of Chairs and seek specific direction when, when triggers happen within those projects. Uh, right at this time, none of those triggers are in place. I mean, they're all in the infancy stage. We're, we're looking at everything from the uh, regional transportation plan by, uh, by Metrolinx. Uh, that's still, they're still in the consultative stage. Um, they're not going to get ratified until sometime in 2018, possibly 2019. Uh, there's uh, <coughs> high-speed rail, uh, which isn't due to start or start uh, operations till 2025. They're just getting going right now at the, at, the, at the provincial level, so really nothing has happened at that. So there's all these projects, they're all, they're all in different stages, but when, when we at a staff level can identify an issue, that's when we would, we would ask the chair to call a meeting and we'd go through... Uh, yeah, and, and, and that through the chair makes good sense to me. Uh, it's too bad we didn't have the committee uh, when we were dealing with the um, uh, here Ontario LRT uh, project because uh, uh, at that time, as we all found out, uh, the, uh, uh, the the people who were supposed to be looking after Brampton Cindrus uh, uh, really uh, didn't do their job, and uh, then we end up with a the messy um, situation, and and that's probably when that was. But it's good to have the committee. So when an issue does come up, uh, the committee is ready to go to action and do the and and do its work. So um, yeah, I, I that's, that's I don't see why the committee should be meeting every every month uh, just to uh, you know talk about. Uh, if, uh, if the transit's running on time or not, uh, if the buses are running on time. Uh, so, yeah, I, I understand what the purpose is, and that's fine with me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Brick. Councillor Moore. Thank you. Well, the point has been made that it was the very first meeting, and I want to say right out the gate that I think staff did an amazing job pulling together all of the projects and highlighting uh, the timelines that were attached to them, who... Uh, was the lead on it, how staff have been working 
with the various other levels of government. Um, I think it's probably, and I think I said it at the committee, a good exercise for staff who are undertaking the work in any event to pull it all together. We get reports at committees over the course of a year or, or two years, but when it was all pulled together in one report, there was a greater appreciation for the work that the staff in our public works department are doing. And, uh, you know, it was great that all members of council got a copy of that report when it was circulated and the meeting uh, was scheduled because then all members of council could take a look and see what we've done. That's the first time I have ever seen all of those projects that the city is involved in pulled together in one document. The formation of the committee, um, right, some are calling it a knee-jerk reaction. It was a reaction for sure. It was a reaction to two things. One was uh, accusations from the media that members of the former council somehow dropped the ball and didn't get anything done and, and weren't uh, you know, doing any heavy lifting on transportation. It was also a reaction to the mayor's comments in that article where she outlined a whole host of activities and meetings and so on that she had been involved in that had never been reported back to this council and that we were unaware of. And so if it is the mayor's job to, to take the lead and to uh, champion on those big picture issues for the municipality, there does need to be a way to report it back. So call it a reaction. I don't think it was knee-jerk. I, I would say that it was probably overdue that uh, we got more involved, uh, and probably since, Harry, you've been brought on board, we've been more prepared going into AMO and FCM to advocate for this community than we have been in a very long time, maybe ever. Right at this meeting today, there's been three things that members of council have said that sort of highlight the need for this committee. If we are going to be working together collectively, council and staff, to move this city forward on any transit file. Um, I didn't know that the Minister of Transportation was in Brampton last week. I don't know who knew. Obviously, Councillor Medeiros knew because he said the Minister was in town last week. So there's an example of something that we didn't know about. December the 8th, the Metrolinx chair is coming and having a meeting with the Mayor. Well, it seems to me that the recommendation that's before us says a member of the Transit Committee should be at that meeting. So I'm not sure what the mechanism is that kicks, starts, or, or kicks into gear to have a member of this committee at that meeting. And it makes perfect sense to me that it be the chair. And if the chair can't attend, then we look to another member of that committee. And maybe it depends on what's being uh, discussed at that meeting and who it might be most appropriate. The chairs of all the committees sit on this. So if it's, it's planning focused, if it's a, a, a corporate initiative or economic development, then maybe the, trans, the Council of Transit Chairs wants to identify who best to attend that meeting. And the other is that Councilor Madero sits on the Metrolinx Board of Directors. Well, that's interesting. I don't, I don't ever recall making an appointment, being invited by Metrolinx to appoint a member to their board. So the question for me would be, is he there representing the city of Brampton, or is he sitting there as a private citizen? So if he's sitting there as a member of this council and representing the city of Brampton, then I would like to see that, uh, that we make that formal appointment and that Councillor Madero says sitting on an ex a board external to this board, to this council, reports back to us. So three things at this meeting, happening on a transit initiative, I don't know who knew about it and who didn't, but I'm just going to say right now, I knew about none of these three things. And that's not how we work together to get something done and move files forward in the city of Brampton. The terms of reference were approved. The terms of reference very clearly, and Peter, you can put them on there, say that we're going to meet twice a year. If we need to visit that, we'll revisit that. But that's what was approved by council. And it also very clearly says advocacy. And Councillor Miles asked the, the question at the meeting, how can we help you, staff, on any of these files? How can we help you? And so I think that's the takeaway for staff when they put all of the files before us and say, here's what we're working on, here's the timelines, 
here's what uh, the outcome uh, is expected to be, here's the work we need to do at the city that, that helps move these files along, how can we help? And so really it's preparing us for the kind of advocacy work so that when the Minister of Transportation happens to be in the city of Brampton, we can be there as one or all members of the committee or council and advocate for our, our, for our city. And the last thing I want to say, Councillor Dillon, you consistently state at this table that the former council didn't do anything, didn't get anything done. Well, I'm going to say one thing. There's a whole heck of a lot more evidence that the previous council did heavy lifting than there is during this term of council. I would say we got more done in one year than this council's got done in three. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, who would have ever thought that we would be getting into this kind of a discussion today? And Councillor Moore is correct. The, uh, the comments that you're quoting, Councillor Dillon, aren't, aren't the full conversation. They're snippets that were intended, um, I believe, in, intended to, to shed a negative light on, on the transit committee. Because I did say to, the, to staff, and, and the comments were intended to, to say that in fact, there's a lot of work that is being done in the city of Brampton. And, and I just ha I have to go back because I quite frankly feel that the city of Brampton has been doing some amazing work on the transit file. And the, the, Zoom, si the Zoom system, which the past council is responsible for, has far exceeded any of the... Uh, other public transit authorities around the GTA and in, in fact we've seen close to 20 percent growth in ridership where other people haven't. That didn't happen in this term of council. That happened in past terms of council. Um, Mr. Petushka, how long have you been with the city? I did not how long does it feel? No, how long? How many years have you been here? It feels like only yesterday but uh but I've been with the city approximately four years. Four years. So when you came here, had the city been doing nothing in the past about tr on transit files? I know he's going to say no. The city has been actively involved in, in uh, go transit, in transportation master plans, in advocating around metro links, in all of the the projects, the majority of the projects that are in that list of 21 started before this term of council. So, <sighs> Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I sat, I was, it wasn't quite as liberal in, in Mississauga as it, as it is here at Brampton where we're working together. We were more siloed. But, but I had my, my eye on, on Brampton, and I can tell you this, um, as far as I'm concerned, when Brampton started the, the Zoom project, here, uh, I thought it was it was the envy of Mississauga. Mississauga had to catch up with their with their my way, and not just not just the branding of the, of the bus, the way they the way they did the stops on the streets, not the technology that went into the into the stops, but even to the part that I always uh, admired was the traffic signal system. Uh, under under Tom Mulligan uh, as part of that Zoom. Brampton got a whole new system put in that's one of the envies in, in the GTA. So uh, a lot of good things came out of, out of that project and, uh, and continues to this day. So at the, at the transit committee meeting, I think um, I asked the question whether, whether or not you felt that the exercise that you'd gone through was, was worthwhile in pulling to get together all of the information and, and uh, got a very positive response from you. Through you, Mr. Chair, and, and as I indicated to, to the committee, uh, we started doing that at a staff level. And, and, and I just mentioned working in Mississauga in a silo. Here, we're working completely differently. And the, and the reason it's, it's a, a regional connection is because it goes across all departments all operating departments. It involves absolutely everybody. 
So it's not just, okay, it's a public works thing, it's, it's everybody's thing. And uh, we just happen to be uh, the custodians of it as regional connections, but everybody's part of it. And in fact, the, the Transit uh, Council of Chairs, a, a, and I don't know if it's up there, but it's supposed to report through uh, corporate services, I believe, if there's any reporting uh, that, that goes back through corporate services and then to council. So, yeah, reports to corporate services because corporate services transcends all departments. So it was set up purposely that way. So we're working that way, and, we're, and you know we're getting bits of information from from all of you here this afternoon. But that's the whole point: is to get our information, your information, and to all work collectively together, staff, elected officials, so that we represent a strong, a strong front to uh, whatever the needs of Brampton are. So um, at the meeting too, there was a lot of discussion around the linkages and the fact that our transit master plan was being updated and um, I know I did make the point about making sure that we had the connectivity with the regional master plan and we also talked about connecting into the subway station in Vaughan and I noticed that there was an announcement just in the last 24 hours about, about that as well. So could you just clarify for other members of council who raised the issue about connectivity and, um, and the discussion that the committee had in regards Council, to Council that? Miles, can I just step in here? What's before us here is the recommendations from the committee. Um, questions like that we can refer back to the committee. Or this, it, is, this the, is the The question was raised by members of council who weren't there, so I just was seeking clarification from Mr. Petushka in regards to that discussion that did take place. Okay, since the question's been asked, Joe, we can respond and then we'll stick back to the recommendations. Thank you. Through, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the, the name of our, of our game changer is regional connections. It's not uh, connections within Brampton. Uh, so it's everything, high-speed rail, the GTA West Corridor that transcends several municipalities. It's, it's high-speed rail, it's, it's two-way all-day go, uh, and on and on and on. It's the LRT that's proposed up the steels. It's the new proposed routes north of steels. You, there's a, a lot of things in, into that, into that, uh, into that um, game changer. And once you get into it, you find out that we're all connected, not just internally, but we're all connected regionally and beyond. So, and and we sit on each other's working committees. We have staff that sit on the on the regional transportation master plan, and they have staff that that, that uh, sit on ours. Uh, we have transit people that that sit on uh, on on various committees. So it's everybody's everybody's involved. Everybody's connected. Uh, this is. Uh, Instead of working in silos, this is, if anything, this is the poster child of, of the way probably things should be, should be uh, looked at collaboratively. So do you, do you, as the Commissioner of Works, see the Transit Committee as being a very positive step that the municipality has taken? Through you, Mr. Chair, we've had one meeting. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, the recommendation two was really close to my heart on that particular one, where Council actually... Uh, put out a strong message that, uh, uh, and that's part of the part of the approval of the minutes, so that, that the tunnel option is, is pursued at Steels and and, and uh, here Ontario. So that's that to me was very positive that day, uh, and and as we go along, I I can see the the regional connections from a staff level integrating with the transit of chairs. Transit of chair, uh, the, the chair, transit of chairs, I believe what, there's five or six members on it. And, and so through the chair, which happens to be the chair of public works and engineering, Councillor Willens, uh, it's a lot easier to get four or five councillors together if there's a real issue uh, than it is to get all the council together. So at the call of the chair, uh, that meeting can take place with a lot more flexibility, more nimbleness to, to get things going. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Was Councilor Dillon speaking to the recommendation? Yeah. Right, speaking to the recommendations and uh, just part of the discussion we, we have had here, and I do uh, think staff has done an excellent job, but there was a, 
uh, comment earlier about uh, the committee, but uh, we're the, we, were the, we were the only, I believe, uh, municipality, major municipality, who didn't have a, a transit committee, and I would call that being not prepared. Uh, and whether you call it an overdue or whether you want to call it a knee-jerk reaction, uh, you know, the point is that, that time has passed us over, passed us over for decades, and if the article didn't come out, uh, would we be sitting here, would we be sitting here uh, speaking about being unprepared? And I think the very foundation of this uh, Transit Council Committee is being unprepared. Uh, and at the same time, we don't, we're still not prepared because we don't have experts and we don't have uh, residents uh, on this committee. Uh, so what real input are we having uh, into it? And so I'm just trying to make sure that we do get prepared because, uh, um, you know, it's about confidence for the residents, and some of the comments made by Council Miles, which she refuses to respond to, don't give residents that uh, confidence. And, um, you know, we heard about being more aggressive. You know, LRT will take 10 years, minimum. Uh, and so our residents want to see action fast. They want to see us working hard. And, you know, there was comments on, I just tell the truth. I don't knock any council, this council or past council. I just try to hold whoever's accountable, hold them accountable. Uh, and so if, I'm not going to get into a list of, uh, you know, past councils because we'd probably be here for uh, quite a while. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so can I get a move to motion to approve the recommendations? Councilor Bowman, all in favor? All in favor of the recommendations? Well, in that carries. Thank you. Now we've come to the uh, to, to, to correspondence. There's no correspondence. Council question period. Question period. Law. Government relations. Does anybody have any questions for law on the government relations portion? 11.1. Oh, sorry. 11.2 law. The highlights from the 2017 Ontario Economic Outlook and Fiscal Review. A strong and fair Ontario. Does anybody have want to see the presentation from Law? Good presentation? Go ahead, Law, you have the floor. You don't, you don't want a presentation? No staff doesn't want a presentation? No? Everybody? Okay, go ahead, Law. <laughs> Poor Law. That's okay. Is it on the? So through you, um, Chair, to the committee, it's not going to be up on the screen, but I did uh, circulate this last night, and you all have a copy of it on your desk. I'd um, like to thank the um, the province for keeping a uh, light read of 194 pages rolled down into 10 pages. So as I go through this, I'm not going to go through this into uh, a lot of great detail, but. Um, you know, just even the past discussion, I think um, what's really important for us, the Transit Council chairs, but all, not only that issue, but on health, on seniors, families, we were talking about community hubs, we were talking about healthy communities. I think as part of the direction we're going from an advocacy and government relations perspective, it's really trying to see where the government is going and ensuring that the city is resourced on both the staff side as well as on the um, council side to really see where the province is going as well as the, as well as the federal government so we can actually align um, our priorities with them. So when we talk about funding or where they are within a process, if it's high-speed rail, if it's go RER, or if it's on hospitals, um, if it's on families, on community hubs, we know where to go and we know how to go it and we can start building those relationships on the bureaucratic as well as on the administrative side. Um, just a few key highlights on the uh, fiscal review. There, the uh, province is budgeting for a, um, a balanced budget for the next three years. Um, when you read the document, there's really not a whole lot of new stuff, so this is very similar to the federal government um, economic statement. Um, the only thing that's new is really that $500 million investment to support small business that I'm sure has everybody's aware of from the, um, from the news and media. That's what they really picked up on. Um, there is the, um, they're also committed to the um, ensuring that uh, the minimum wage increases to, 50, uh, to $15 by 2019. 
Um, as part of that 500 million, I did want to point out that uh, the third bullet on slide four speaks to the investments to enhance the vibrancy of communities and Main Street. So here's an opportunity. Um, so it's an additional $40 million, but here's an another opportunity for us to reach out to our MPPs and see how we can actually start to work with them and better understand how we as a municipality, we can support ourselves, but also the business community to access that so we can actually improve our downtown for all the various um, items that fill within that uh, portfolio. Uh, the rest of the presentation really sp speaks to the recommitments from the uh, provincial government. So they are investing in health care, so capital dollars for new and expanding of hospitals, increasing the uh, number of beds throughout Ontario. As we'll all be aware, there was the, uh, the hospital expansion announcement as well as the additional beds from last week. Uh, the province remains committed to uh, mental health and addiction services. On slide six... Um, last week, the uh, province announced their senior strategy, and we provided some context for that last week, so they are really committing um, to see where the province is going from an age perspective. The last bullet there, just to point out where we are as a senior's population, we're sitting at about just over 66,000, but as we've talked about as we move towards 2041, we know that's going to be exploding. So what's really important for us as a staff and for council is to really better understand what are the programs that are available from a provincial standpoint, and how can we actually start doing better planning planning today for that future population. <clears throat> On the family side, um, they are committed to supporting, you know, increasing the number of childcare spaces across Ontario. The region has um, really taken that. Um, it has done a very good job on that. The OHIP Plus, which is providing free uh, pharma or uh, free prescription drugs for um, those 25 or under is um, going to be starting January 1st, 2018. Uh, on the reduction of poverty and the reason why I included these is because we've had this discussion around this council table how it's not just speaking about being a single tier municipality but it's how we can work with the region appeal and again there was another one of those conversations that I heard uh, this morning so I think it's really important for us to better understand that as a, a municipality so they are committed to increasing Ontario works income security um, as well as um, previously we spoke oh, there you go. we spoke about um, <laughs> The continuing the fair housing plan and that's supposed to help with the um, the housing market as I previously mentioned on the 20th there's going to be an affordable housing uh, framework that's going to be discussed so how can we work with the problem so again here's another opportunity how we can engage not only um, the region appeal but our MPPs to see what can the city do and how can we leverage um, what the province is going after so I think that these are all very important quite honestly timely um, conversations on slide nine can I move that or is that perfect um, these are a few of the other recommitments. You know, again, when we talk about infrastructure and transit, you know, the province, you know, if you look at, you know, the debt to GDP, it, it's quite high from when you look back to 20, 2008, but there is investment, so the dollars are coming from somewhere. Um, they are committed to $190 billion over 13, so here's an opportunity for us to, you know, build those relationships so we can leverage those dollars. The province is recommitted to the innovation, so again, you know, we, you know, the university is really exciting as the province looks at increasing the number of STEM graduates. I think the city has a great opportunity to play an important role there. And then on the last slide, if we can get there. Um, Full disclosure, I'm a bit of a policy nerd, so when you go through the document, you kind of find some of these small little nuggets. Um, so they are looking at um, developing an Ontario statistics office. So I think it's really great that, you know, Stats Can now is do doing the census. So here's another opportunity as the municipality looks at um, open government, open data. Here's an opportunity to have conversations about how we can share the information. Because again, if you're dealing with health, if you're dealing with poverty, if what any of those issues are, it's really important for us to be um, working together, that we're all using the same data, and we actually know how to use that data. So we're not using it from, um, you know, anything different than what they're intended to do. So that's the fall economic statement in a nutshell. Thank you very much for clerks for getting that, uh, getting that up, and happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, it's for the Chair. Um, I guess, the, first of all, uh, Great work as usual, I tell you. It's uh, um, for someone who is an intergovernmental policy advisor <laughs> for several years, like you did a fantastic job. You know, I'm almost jealous. Um, when you go to page four, uh, so we talk about the youth job connection employment service. And I know that's run through our, uh, some of these small business uh, uh, programs is run through ECDEV. Can we just make sure in terms of the communication, and I know they do a good job, but I always hear from businesses that they don't know about some of these opportunities. 
So it's just if we can refer that to, I don't know if it's referred to the committee or to staff, because um, this is this is a real good opportunity for uh, um, for our businesses to take advantage of. So that's regarding the youth uh, job connection. Uh, that's just more of a comment through the chair as well. Just a little, um, I've been the, regarding the additional beds. Page five uh, on William Osler, and my understanding, I heard the minister say 37, but my understanding is 31. So I'm not sure if it's 31, 37. Uh, through you, Chair, um, <clears throat> through the, when the province first made the announcement, uh, the hospital 31 received plus six the beds. previous six, right? Six, and then Perfect. at the announcement last week, they announced the 31, so 37 beds in total. Great. And, and just through the Chair, um, yeah, a lot of, and especially with, uh, the, uh, I guess, the plan around poverty, when you see, um, you know, several people talked about that region, that uh, United Way report about the income disparity that's happening in our region how important this and I think one of the comments all that you really said and and I really like this approach about you know not all these issues that we can tackle directly some of us not our competence but the fact is we're two tier we can work with the region you know joint program and joint initiatives some type of to tackle some of these issues which transcends I guess you know some of our business but uh, it goes back to I guess the health debate that we talked about you know last week and uh, um, you know just really exciting opportunities for us to sort of uh, Complement and work with the region on this. So, uh, collaboration, collaboration. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Medeiros. Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you all for the report. I'm going to ask one question on this, and then I have another question on just regular government governance relations. How many of these announcements are reannouncements? I mean, it's very obvious what's going on right now, which is the announcement, announcement, announcements, throwing money at an election for next year. Do you have a figure? If you don't, I won't put you on the spot. Uh, thank you, through Chair. I, I don't have the number of announcements, but um, if you look from other than slide four, the rest are recommitments um, from the provincial government. Um, most of the big policy and the funding buckets come through the, the actual budget. So if they announce, you know, X amount of dollars over a number of years, the, the, the announcements and re-announcements you hear might just be a community or some other initiative across Ontario receiving um, funding under a particular program that, that relates back to the provincial budget. So I, don't, I can't quantify the number, but if you kind of hear the same story over and over again, it's because it's just a re-announcement, but in a different community or for a different business community. If it's a duck, it's a duck. Um, uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't know what else to say. I've never seen so many ribbon cuttings and announcements in my life in Brampton. It's very obvious, though, to me, anyway, that Brampton's a place to get right now in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think the Liberals, I think the Conservatives, I think the NDP all recognize that in the next election, Brampton's a very important place to get. I've never in my life seen so many uh, leaders in Brampton is what we've seen in the last year. And that, maybe that's a good news story for us, because I think it gives us leverage, and I think we've got to play a little tough politics with the province right now. However, I'm going to go back to my old question again on governance at the Region Appeal. And we met with the ministers in um, August. We sent a letter to, I think, to the Premier requesting a meeting. Have we heard anything? It's now November. Do you know if we've heard anything? Is there a response that, yes, I'd like to meet with you, or go fly a kite, or whatever? <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, the, the Premier's office didn't reply to me, but I believe that it was either last meeting or two meetings ago, the Mayor did uh, mentioned that she was going to follow up with the Premier's office about the next steps. As but we've to done that. Like the Mayor already told us that uh, a month ago that she was going to follow up with another letter and did. So we haven't heard anything back. So although it seems that they all want to be here at the farmer's market, they all want to be here making all these announcements that sometimes don't have anything to do with Brampton, we're still being ignored by the Premier on governance, which you know, for those of you that don't sit at the region, I'm going to tell you, and then the, the, the regional issues that are coming up in the next few years are going to be huge. And we don't have the votes to represent Brampton at the regional field. 
just as simple as that. You can't make it any simpler. Mississauga's got us, and anything they want, they're going to get. And if it, I tell you right now, if it wasn't for the report that came out on the roads, Mississauga would have had the roads all shoved down our throats. But the only reason they backed off on that because they found it was going to cost them more than any of them had ever dreamed it was going to cost them. And unfortunately, that didn't, that didn't get out there in the press very much. But that's the truth of it. The report basically said, you don't want to do this. So I'm going to harp at this right to the last day that I'm here. Because we are getting, we are getting stamped on. We are getting stamped on by the province. We're getting stamped on by Mississauga every time they want something to the region. And um, I don't think we're doing enough about it. I don't know what the answer is, I said this before, but we're not doing enough about it. That's my rant. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Councillor Dillon. Uh, questions on 11.2? I just want to just uh, jump off a question, um, off a comment Councillor Gibson made. Uh, the Premier hasn't replied back, um, but there was a uh, request for staff to report back on uh, legal routes. To the to for, for regional representation is that coming back soon through you, um, Chair? I can check, but um, if you recall, um, Dennis Squires talked about four weeks or so, and that would be in a couple weeks. Oh, is that right? Okay. Thank you, Councilor. Then Councilor Medeiros. Yeah, just uh, through the chair, and I think Councilor Gibson raises some uh, important issues. The, the, the only um, specifically around our regional governance, but the only thing I've I've seen being at the region is. Uh, you know, we often don't vote all together, so our voice is fragmented. And that was a demonstration on our last vote where I thought we had a, a clear recommendation supported by all the council. And in our regional council, there was two or three votes um, opposing. So I'm not sure, unless we're all on the same page, um, I'm not sure how that works. Uh, but regardless, uh, you are correct. And uh, many of these issues, it would be great to have more of a Brampton voice. And, um, and I'm just in through the chair as well. Uh, regarding regional chair, do we have any information about who are candidates or, or what's going on, the opportunity? Because, you know, one thing that becomes very apparent, they're going to have their agenda as well. So not only are we dealing with different agendas, um, a regional chair now is going to be essentially someone who's going to have their own political agenda, and how do we have the opportunity to, to I guess, express our views and our opinions, um, you know, as a municipality? To ensure, and I guess when that comes to parent, that will be some of the, the homework you'll have to do in your in your capacity. Uh, through the chair to you, I you know it would just be speculation, but I haven't seen anybody register or nominated for that yeah. chair yet. So, so through you, um, candidates for regional chair cannot register till May first of twenty eighteen, the same date as candidates for municipal council can register. Very good, guys. Get someone to move all support. Council Medeiros, all in favor? That carries. Thank you. We do have to go back to 11.1. I apologize. It's um, cor it's just correspondence and for receipt. Can I get a motion to receipt? That Councillor Bowman. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Now we go back to Councillor Miles. Um, go ahead. Um, Mr. Elliott has a motion, or the clerk has a motion. Councilor Fertini? Yeah, uh, through the clerk up here. It says places of worship. Shall we put all places of worship? Or is it just going to be. Through you, uh, we could add that wording. I, I think it's implied that it would be any place, any no. places of worship that would be subject be okay. to development charges. Transfer recorded vote. Uh, it could be by the SMO. A recorded, a, recorded, a recorded vote has been asked 
and we're going to the buttons. Can we read it one more time? This is the same. This is, yeah, just a change. Councilman are you okay with the motion? Yeah. Okay. It's fine. Thank you. Very good. So a recorded vote's been requested on the motion on the screen. Voting is now open. No, there was, through you, Mr. Chair, there was discussion about referral. Um, but it, the item was stood down to allow staff to work with the councillor to come up with the motion, and now it's being presented for consideration. All members present have voted. The motion carries unanimously, eight to zero. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're at the point of the meeting, public question period. I don't see anybody from the public. There's no closed session, so we will make a motion to adjourn. Our next regular meeting is December 6th. Motion to adjourn? That's okay, I'll ask. Oh, uh, I'll ask quickly. Okay. One motion to adjourn. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Council done. All in favor? Thank you. That's carried. Have a nice day.